Welcome to episode four of Talking Prisoner. Today we have a very special guest with us. This man is responsible for Prisoner becoming the show that fans have come to love today. He worked on Prisoner from day one as a writer, producer and executive producer. Now, without him, I could safely say that we would not be here talking about this program today. In 1992, he was appointed Vice President of Drama for Grundy Worldwide, which made him responsible for more than 200 hours of drama production each year. Everyone meet Mr. Ian Bradley. Welcome to Talking Prisoner. Thanks, Matt. Nice to be here. Nice to meet you also. Ian, we have a lot of prisoner questions, but first, for the fans that don't know about your life, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you, where you grew up and what was your childhood uh, like? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a war baby. Um, um, I was born during World War II. I was born and raised on a, on a council estate in the west of England. Um, the estate was actually built to rehouse uh, people who'd been bombed out in the Blitz. And as a consequence, all the people came from different areas. There was no real feeling of community in the place. You, you really think it was, was a, a sort of artistic and intellectual wasteland. Uh, I was the only kid I knew who actually stayed to school at school until I was 16 to do my GCEs. Everybody else had gone off to be laborers or whatever. So the fact that I went to grammar school and the fact that I did stay at school when they were off working and making a lot of money made me feel a bit of an outsider. I never really felt that I fitted in there. And, you know, whilst I was still in my teens, I uh, applied to be a 10 pan palm and be assisted over here as a kid. And I came over here on my own. Wow. Okay. At the age of 14, you had a passion for going to the movies on a Sunday night. What type of movies did you uh, like? Did you go and watch that uh, gave you the interest in the TV industry? Well, to be honest, the movies were just an escape. Yep. I mean, there were two things that were a great escape in my youth. One was playing soccer and the other was going to the movies. And I, didn't re I wasn't really discerning about what I went to see. Uh, there were only a couple of cinemas in Bath at the time where we, where we lived. Um, and if and most of them ran for a couple of weeks. So I saw just about everything that came on. Uh, but I met, remember particularly musicals like Rock Around the Clock and Espresso Bongo, even The Student Prince. I mean, that's how eclectic my tastes were. Uh, and a lot of uh, the... Uh, the period dramas, the hornblowers and the westerns and all the rest of it, but it was all escapism. It didn't actually engender any interest in the industry for me. That all came from television. Okay, okay. But at the time you also had a, a show that was a favorite show of you called, uh, sorry, a favorite show of yours called Zed Cars, which was a- Oh yeah, well the television was an entirely different thing. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky. I mean, we, we got television for the first time for the coronation for 1953, um, sort of nine years old. And the, from the 50s into the 60s was the really golden age of television drama, really, I think. Um, there's been another golden age for the, the Netflix and whatever lately, but for free to air television, that was the moment. That was the time when great uh, dramatists like Paddy Choyskiewski and John Hopkins were writing one-off dramas and uh, things like talking to a stranger and whatever. And what fascinated me about them was the way the stories were told. Yeah. And the particular influence of Zed Cars was that it was actually filmed to, taped, but went to air live. So oh, the wow. actors actually performed it live. Now, I don't know, I think you might have seen an episode of it, Matt. You uh, wouldn't have if that was the case. Uh, but what they did was they would shoot the scene and then they'd move the camera. Uh, they'd have other cameras waiting with other actors to do the next scene. What that meant was they had to do separate storylines. You couldn't have the copper getting the call, driving to the location and investigating the crime 
in sequence if you were doing it live because it would have taken forever. So what they what they invented was the multi-strand storytelling technique. And, the, and that really is what fascinated me was the way that they invented the stories they were telling in order to be able to make them. So that, that really created my interest in not only writing for television, but producing for television because I've realized that you actually produce the show at the script stage. You, you worked out how much it was going to cost, how long it was going to take, uh, all the, those other elements at the script stage, and then you just follow through from there. So that was really the fascination for me. I've just always been fascinated on how things work. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't even then, whilst in England, think I was ever going to be a television producer, but I'd certainly already developed a real interest on how it was done and why it was done. Uh, I would never have picked that up watching that show because I, I actually really enjoy it. And I, I would never. No, have... well, but, but that's one of the reasons why, sadly, there are so few tapes of it left because yeah. they were, it was just shot live. It was incredible, incredible show and very clever. I, I, uh, yeah. I, um, I, I was always fascinated. I, I can't tell you a single plot from it. I can only tell you how it was put together and, uh, and who the characters were in the summer. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, British TV shows. I, I think they're amazing. All those old shows from the 60s and 70s. They're, they're just yeah, so I, I've, I've always been a... I've always preferred English television and American films. Yeah. Um, and you can see that in the style that I have developed here. Um, some of my bigger hits like The Great Bookie Robbery you know, is very much like The Long Good Friday. Um, yeah. th those are the style of movies that, I, that I've that i made and the television that I've made. Your talent for accounts uh, came to the fore a little bit where, when you were working for C&J Clark's shoe company and they had an incentive for workers if they found a way to bring down costs, which is what you did. Did the shoe company take up your idea and also, can you tell us about the time the lady next door gave you a copy of Sporting Life and what impact that had on your life? Right. There are two questions there. And, they, and sequentially, they happened at a different time. I was still only 12 when the, the lady that I called Auntie Ada came over with the Sporting Life. She was a hard-drinking, hard-gambling woman, um, very good-natured. Uh, and I was sick at one stage and she came over and gave me the Sporting Life, which is a form paper for the races, uh, and asked me to work out to pick some winners. And she, she told me that, in fact, it was all based on mathematics and how gave me an article on how you handicap horses and, and uh, um, how to pick, select who's likely to win because of their handicaps. And I uh, spent the morning working out these horses. She came in and took my tips and went off to work uh, and then go and get drunk at the illegal bookmakers <laughs> and then came back with and gave me 10 shillings. Well, I was getting six, six months a week pocket money in those days. So I thought this is pretty good. But my interest in it really was work again, working out how it worked, what we did to make the what what the handicappers did to to set the races and what you needed to do to work out where they'd made mistakes and where you got profit so that did in fact allow me for about the first 10 years of my career as a writer and producer to actually live almost exclusively from gambling because i didn't take any i didn't sell that many scripts i didn't get that many jobs you know it took me 10 years to get established um, going on to your question about C and J Clarks, at the time I didn't like <laughs> C and J Clarks, particularly since I did come up with this um, solution on how they could save a lot of money, and they refused to pay me because they said I was staff. I wasn't <sighs> one of the uh, one of the workers, but in fact, working for C and J Clarks was enormously helpful to me. Because I, what my main job there was to work out how much shoes would cost before they were actually made to decide whether they were going to make them. 
Now, the only way you can do that is to work out, is to learn how shoes are made and what all the sequences are and how you put them together and then put, put a price on them. It's exactly the same process with the film. You, uh, you come up with an idea, you, you know how the film is going to be made, you take the time, you work out the time, locations, the people you work, it's, you cost the film in the same way as you cost the shoe. So when I eventually became a producer, I found that all the skills that I acquired costing runabout shoes for C&J Clarks were, uh, were very useful. That's the, the second part of the, about the place that worked well for me was that I was so pissed off that they wouldn't give me the money um, because it would, have, it would have represented enough money to buy a house, you know, as a 19 year old. I was so pissed off that I so bugger this, I'm, not only didn't, wouldn't they give me the money, they told me that even though I was the acting accountant, they didn't allow anybody under 30 to be an accountant, so I couldn't be promoted for 11 years. My reaction to that was to phone up Australia House and say, excuse me, if you've got, <laughs> you've got room for a little one, I'll be over there immediately. So, you know, not only did they teach me how to produce sh television shows, they also gave me the incentive to go to Australia. And that comes to my next question. It was in 1965, you arrived in Australia, in Sydney. How come you chose Sydney as the destination? Well, I didn't choose Sydney. I mean, I was a, an assisted migrant, supposedly um, going to a children's home to, uh, to live when I arrived here. I landed in Sydney, thought it was absolutely beautiful. Um, the people from the home put me on a bus and took me out west somewhere. I can't even tell you where because I, I got to the place, walked into the, the, the hostel where all the kids lived. And I thought, bugger this, I was better off in England. So I just walked out the back door, got the train and went back to Sydney and, from, and just survived by myself. And the reason, I mean, it was very fortuitous um, because I, I'd met on the boat going over, I'd met the guy who was going to become the head of drama for ABC. Um, I developed an interest in, in the television. We discussed that sort of thing. I also met an actor called Stan Walsh, who was a, a big poker player. And I, I became involved in the circle of the industry through them and also through costing shows that, for them in order to, to, to see if they'd make them. Now, the industry in those days was based basically and mostly around the ABC. There wasn't much else happening. The ABC was in King's Cross. The pub in King's Cross where all the ABC officials came was also the pub where all the local prostitutes and standover men came. And just up the street were all the illegal gambling clubs. So this was heaven to me. I arrived in a place where, you know, I could pursue my interests in television and in gambling with, you know, without moving too far from the bar. But the main thing that struck me about in Sydney in those days was how corrupt it was. I mean, all of these institutions were illegal. Um, the first time I went into a club called the 33 Club, I, was, I just couldn't understand how they could be so open. And the guy who had taken me in pointed out three people and said, you see that? That's the prime minister, that's the premier, Askin. That's the police commissioner, Norm Allen. That's Mr. Big of Crime, Lenny McPherson. And they own this club. Can we just tell the what the 33 Club was, just so they know? Is that okay? okay. Well, it 33 was Club was, was a club at 33 Oxford Street, in, in just up from the cross. The clubs were amazing because well, they made a hell of a lot of money, but they were decked out with chandeliers, women in low-cut dresses, free drinks, free food. And for me, the big attraction of them, as opposed to the modern day casinos, is no poker machines. Poker machines were just banned. This, this, this was grown up casinos. Um, and I, you know, for the next 10 years, spent some time every week in them playing poker. Wow. And the Premier of New South Wales was at these casinos. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think if, if you 
if you don't know, don't take my word for it. You can you can Google it and you'll find books. Um, the, the the big criminals those days, Larry McPherson, Pierce Scalia, Abe Saffron, there have been writ books written about all of them, and the fact that Commissioner Allen um, and uh, Premier Askin, also Commissioner Clanson, who preceded Allen, were all in together with you know the, the, the story they they tell in the books is they they were getting paid a hundred thousand pounds in those days wow. a year to just look the other way. And it wasn't until the Labour Party came in uh, and legalised the casino in uh, in Sydney that the, the gambling clubs virtually got put out of business. Now, in uh, I think it's 1977, you actually married Anne Lucas, who is also a writer and was on Prisoner playing the role of Faye Quinn. How yep. did you and Anne meet? Well, Anne... I mean, when I was a struggling writer and, uh, well, I don't know whether I was a writer who gambled or a gambler who wrote, but when I was through my 20s uh, and sort of hanging around in amongst with all the other uh, um, people in the industry, uh, there were a lot of, in the cross, there were, there were several small theatres that, uh, that didn't have much money, but, but did mostly left-wing drama or whatever. And uh, they used to hold um, fundraising nights, you know, dinner, you know, 50 people to turn up and have curry and box wine and, and beer. And I turned up at one of these for the Stables Theatre one night and uh, Annie was there um, as the hostess. And I don't, I, I distinctly remember she had her hair cut very short. She had dro drop earrings. She was wearing a green Choi Sam. Um, I don't think she even remembered me. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was years later that um, we got together by, by good fortune really in, in the local pub um, when an actor wanted to meet an actress that I'd been working with on stage in in uh, North Sydney, uh, and I offered to take him over to to meet her, and he got kind of nervous, and he asked Anne to come along um, to give him moral support. And as it turned out, the actress wasn't interested in him, but uh, Annie and I went on to a poker game, and then onto the races, and we've been together now for I can't remember how many years it is, but it must be pushing towards fifty now. Wow. The rest is history. And can I add? She, I mean, she played a great part on Prisoner. I mean, as a writer, but also as Faye Quinn. She was. Yeah, um, look, she she was a very successful actress long before she met me. I mean, she was in Bellbird. Ken, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, she used to do all the um, whenever the English came out with their comedies, um, you know, Not My Darling and uh, all those sorts of shows. She was always the ingenue who played. Uh, played in those shows, so she her career was far more successful than mine in the early years, and really she only got into writing and script editing because when I came down to Melbourne to make Prisoner, uh, Hector Crawford, who um, ran ran the city really in terms of the industry, had put out the word that people shouldn't work with me because we were rivals in Grundy's. And I didn't have a script editor, and I, and it was just Annie and I, and so she edited the scripts and then moved on to be a writer. And, she, and I think she's a better writer than I was in the end. Um, she, she certainly got nominated for AFI awards for wow. shows like um, like Embassy. But basically, I'd come up with the ideas, and she'd do all the work. So just going back to Hector Crawford for a minute. So he was telling people not to work for you, because <laughs> yeah, oh, look, it. it one of the things about Prisoner was it, it actually felt like a prison when we came to Melbourne to make it because we were sort of coming up against these walls. I had a lot of friends who worked at Crawford's. Um, but when I came to Melbourne, uh, I couldn't understand why none of them would talk to me or answer my calls when I phoned them up. And I bumped into one of them, a guy called Ted Ogden, who uh, uh, was a writer there. And I said, Ted, what is this? I mean, how come you're not talking to me? And he said, I haven't received your calls. 
So he went to check with the telephonist at Crawford's and the directive was that if I called, nobody was to, to, to answer me because they were afraid I was going to steal their personnel. Wow. Many of whom I did steal, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's how scared they were of you. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, you know, Ken, Hector dominated Melbourne. Nobody else made anything. Um, he did, and he was very good at it. Um, and he just wouldn't move north. He didn't try anything in Sydney. And he was very upset that Grundy's, who basically owned Sydney at that time, um, were presumptive enough to uh, send somebody down to start working in, in Melbourne. So it, it felt a bit like a prison. You, you, you know, in the same way that people were hemmed in, so we were hemmed in. I think it helped the atmosphere and helped, helped the, the crew, the, the cast and the writers become a much closer knit unit because um, we were the only friends we had, so to speak. <laughs> I wanted to um, touch on some of the jobs that you've had in your life because you, you've had a few, oh. you're an insurance clerk, accountant, professional gambler, carpet cleaner, theatre critic, actor and writer. Which one of these jobs stood out to you the most? And did you draw, sorry, draw on any ideas for writing on the jobs that you had in your life? Well, they sort of fall into two categories. I mean, the jobs in England and for the first couple of years here, when I was a, an insurance clerk. And I, I got out of the insurance business because it was so crooked. You know, insurance is supposed to be helping people. They, they're not there to do that at all. They're just to make money. But the accountant's job, all of them, because they were I was a cost account and works accountant, were very helpful for me in terms of becoming a producer later. All the other jobs really stemmed from the fact that I decided in, when I was 21, I wanted to be a writer and I didn't know necessarily, I didn't know enough about the world, to be honest. I didn't know enough about the industry. And therefore I would basically take anything as a job short term to just expand my horizons and my knowledge of the industry. So set against that was the fact that my main source of income was gambling all the time. So I, I, uh, I guess gambling was the one thing that was of no use to me um, <laughs> in terms of becoming a television producer, except that I've taken lots of big gambles in my life in leaving successful shows in setting in coming to Melbourne to set up a show against the wishes of Hector Crawford. I mean, it, I, I really gave up gambling once I became a producer because the whole industry is a gamble. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, that my, my following question, the realisation that you shouldn't let the possibility of failure prevent you from trying anything was a lesson you learned as a young man. And you, from what you say, you did have the same attitude working in TV uh, in regard to trying anything. Yeah, well, that's, that's basically true. Uh, there is a huge advantage, Ken, um, in being in a country where you know absolutely nobody. I mean, if I made a complete clown of myself, nobody knew. <laughs> you know, I, the family didn't know, my, fr my fr friends didn't know. And so that gave me an enormous freedom to have a go at anything. And I had a plan in, in that uh, I wanted to be a writer and I'd have a go at anything. I'd worked on crew uh, in various capacities in order to learn more about the process so that I could write better scripts. And it wasn't until I was almost 30 and I'd been doing this for eight, <coughs> eight years and not being very successful that my darling wife Annie persuaded me that really I shouldn't be a writer, I should be a producer. And that's what I was suited for. Uh, and so at the age of 30, I changed tack and decided to be a writer, uh, to be a producer. The next year I produced my first television drama pilot or comedy pilot. The following year I managed the, a pantomime around Victoria and the year after that I was a floor manager on 
young doctors. And a year after that, I was producing Prisoner. So once I decided that it was a, pr a producer, I should be not a writer or a writer producer. It became my, my, uh, my career moved forward very quickly. But it, it only would have moved forward quickly because I'd done all those other things before. Yeah. Just going back to what Ken asked you about the realization that you shouldn't let the possibility of failure prevent you from trying anything. Would that be a piece of advice that you would give to anyone that's trying to get into the into the TV industry as an actor or behind the scenes? Is, is that something you would take? Look, if, nobody's going to give you a job. I mean, you've got to you've got to get out there and have a go at it. And I mean, that's the that's the fundamental. You, the industry has changed enormously from the day when I started. I mean, I I could wander into the pub in, uh, in, in the Gladstone with no experience as a working, working on a, any particular sort of crew and just talk to somebody and get myself a job, um, which happened several times. Uh, and then other times I'd have some job on a crew. Um, I, I, we made a pilot of a, a, a golf show where I was the location manager but we, we got to Tasmania and the, there was an airport strike and half the crew and didn't turn up. So I ended up being first assistant producer, ran the whole thing um, because I was the only one there. Uh, so it's not so much a deliberately putting myself in the position where I was taking a risk. It was simply when the, when the opportunities presented themselves, you just grab them and you don't worry. Um, uh, uh, and there's no thing, point in waiting for the big break was the other thing that I learned because I spent eight years doing that and it was only when I decided that, that I had to knuckle down and perhaps make shows that I wasn't particularly interested in in order to get where I wanted to be okay. that I really moved on. I think I've mentioned, you've both read my the draft of my autobiography, I think I've mentioned quite a few times that you learn more from working on bad shows than you do from working on good shows. On good shows, you can just, just float through and you never really notice what happens. But on bad shows where things go wrong, you have to think about how to put them right and you, you learn what, what yeah. it is that's going wrong and how to put it right. So I mean, I, I've worked on some doozies of bad shows in the early days. I couldn't put that autobiography down. I mean, it was just... Your life is, I mean, it's a movie in itself. It was amazing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I wouldn't make the movie, but if you say well, so. Ben would. Yeah. <laughs> Bring him out of retirement. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you purchased your first car with the winnings from a horse race. What sort of car did you, uh, did you buy? And did you ever think you could be a professional gambler? Well, I mean, you were. Well, I wasn't actually at that time, but but the I'm not quite sure how, how you come to make these connections, but they are connected. I did uh, get the money to buy my first car uh, from gambling. It was a Ford V8 Pilot. Um, I don't know if you remember such a thing, a huge gas guzzler American car. Uh, and having bought the car, I then set off to drive around Australia um, just to see the world really. Um, and I got as far as Queensland and the car broke down uh, and was irrepa <laughs> irreparable. Um, and I thought I'd have to get a job in Brisbane. And Brisbane was a country town in those days. The only, uh, they didn't take casual work and whatever. The only job I was offered was a trainee executive in the oil industry. Oh wow! Um, and I thought, God, I don't think I want to be a an executive, trainee executive. I'm not even sure what a trainee executive is. Um, and they were only offering £10 a week. And I thought, all I'll do is I'll go to the races. I've, I've only got like 20 quid left in my, to my name. Um, and I'll pick a horse out and I'll have 10 quid each way on it. Uh, and if it wins, then I'll, I'll, I'll win three months wages. And that'll give me time to work out what the hell I'm going to do with my life. Um, and I, I can tell you the name of the horse and I can tell you the race. It actually did win at 100 to 8 and I picked up three months wages 
and thought, well, I'm just not going to work. Um, and it wasn't until I returned to Sydney the following year that uh, I actually briefly went back to work again. But, you know, it, the, the connection was that uh, I, I figured I could support myself. Um, and while I worked briefly as an accountant, uh, I, I also sold my first television script. Um, and uh, so I resigned as an accountant thinking I'd be a writer and then carried on as a writer stroke gambler for the next 10 years. And that, that was one thing I loved about reading the, uh, the draft of the autobiography was that anytime there was a problem or something, you, you just knew what you were going to do to fix it. You never just sort of sat back and went, oh, what do I do now? You just had this, you're always forward thinking in what you were going to do. Yeah, I, I can't tell. It's, it would be wrong to say there was a grand plan, but there was an, always an ultimate intention. Um, I always knew where I wanted to be, which was basically living in the lap, lap of luxury and only doing work that I enjoyed. Um, and that's where I managed to get for a, a good number of years because, uh, I mean, from the time that I took over prisoner, really to the time I virtually retired after making films like um, One Way Ticket and Nihaka, um, well, probably One Way Ticket was the last one. I had complete creative control of the shows I was making. Yeah. A producer can't get that these days. Um, and that's, that had a lot to do with the fact that I, um, that I retired because you, you can't just make what you want anymore. There are all sorts of money people and other people who, are, who, who have creative control over projects in order to get it financed. And that just didn't suit me. So can you tell us about the moment that you had that realization that you wanted to become a television producer? That, that, that I don't know that it was a realization um, that I wanted to become a television producer. It was a realization that I wasn't going about it in the right way. Um, but I always refer to it as my Jesus moment because I was 30. And as you know, Jesus went out into the desert at 30 and turned into the Messiah after being a carpenter. Um, I'd been working, I'd, I'd basically, basically been supporting myself by gambling and doing odd jobs in the industry for eight years at that stage with the intention that I was one day going to be a famous writer. And it was at the age of 30, I decided I'm no longer a promising young man. I'm in danger of becoming and never was. So I better change the, uh, the direction of my career. Uh, and that's when I decided that if nobody else was going to buy my scripts, I'd produce them myself. Uh, and I switched to uh, become a producer. Uh, I don't know if you, I also, the other reference I always make with, with Jesus, he took uh, three years and he was dead, which is pretty unfortunate. It actually took me four years to become a successful producer on the prisoner. So, but I survived it. <laughs> Kerbo the koala. Uh, a name uh. to conjure by. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us a little bit about good old Curvo? Well, yeah, this was one of the, the, the more valuable jobs that I had, really, and one of the worst productions <clears throat> that I ever worked on. <clears throat> Back in the 60s, it wasn't unusual for people to turn up with American accents or English accents or whatever, claim to be producers and famous uh, and persuade some poor local suckers to put up some money to make a show. Um, one particular guy turned up from Northern Ireland uh, claiming to have been a stuntman on the Bond films. And his pitch was that since the uh, Skippy the Kangaroo had worked around the world, he was gonna make a series called Kerber the Koala, which would do the same thing. Um, so he managed to local, managed to persuade some local people to put up money. He managed to get a, a film company, Ajax, to put up the facilities. He hired a director from, um, from Skippy uh, and then said he was going to make a pilot. The problem was he had no idea how to produce a show at all. Um, he, 
he would be in the pub and people would walk up to him and he'd give them jobs. Um, no, there was no money for pre-production. There was no time for pre-production. The director was just fitting it in in his cycle at, uh, at Skippy. And I rather fortuitously, because uh, everybody else was getting a job and I wasn't, said to Sky Jim McKnight, well, what about giving me a job, Jim? And he said, come into the office and I'll see you on Monday. And I turned up on Monday and uh, I knew the director. I also knew the first assistant, David Copping. And, I, and David said, oh, there you are. You're the art department, <laughs> your props, standby <laughs> props and special effects. The plot was bushfires. So I had to burn down half of uh, Warringa Chase. Um, I didn't know anything about anything. So we went into the script meeting, the uh, production meeting, and I just wrote on my script all the things that I needed, all the props and all the things that I was required to do. Um, drove out to a petroleum company in, in uh, um, Rose Hill, uh, out near the race course, and got a few drums of petroleum jelly, which you wrap around trees to set fire to them and then put out. Uh, and then proceeded to become, proceeded to work on the show. Now, I was the only one who actually, because I, I took almost no time for, to get prepared, um, I spent the rest of my week going around with the location manager looking at the locations. Nobody else had seen them. And on the first day of the shoot, um, we turned, out to, turned up at uh, Warringah Chase uh, for, for the home location, um, which was uh, the same place as they use for Skippy. Um, the producer hadn't turned up. The director was there with the, um, with the first assistant. And his director got fed up with waiting. So he announced to the first assistant, he suddenly said to the first assistant, let's get going, we'll go to the first location. And the first assistant stood up on his four wheel drive and yelled, wagons roll, which was, you know, something from, from wagon train, uh, wagon train, uh, and drove out of the complex. And then everybody got into their trucks and they followed the location manager as he drove out after it, but he couldn't keep up. Now, the location manager was a guy who spent his entire life sitting on the in the bar at uh, the Gladstone doing crossword puzzles. And when he wasn't in the bar, he was supposedly a B, an ABC radio producer. He had no idea what a location manager did. He also didn't know where the locations were. And I, I found myself in this column of vehicles going out into the bush. And I thought, I've never been out here. We didn't have a location out here. So I pulled out of the column and drove up to the front and said, where are we going? And the guy said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, well, what scene are we shooting? And fortunately, he had the continuity girl with him and she told me. And I said, well, I know where that is. So I actually led the crew to the location and we started shooting. And we were shooting all day. And then about sometime after lunch, the producer turned up very upset because nobody had told him where his crew was. And I, now you really learn from a production like that. You, you, you really know that how important planning is and everything else. Uh, so it, it was great fun working on it, um, setting fire to trees. I mean, we had the, the uh, fire brigade next to us. And uh, in a way, it also worked very well because the director uh, subsequently was the man who, when I'd worked for him as a, a first assistant later, was the man who recommended me to come and go and work at, uh, at Grundy's, which I never would have thought of. Um, so again, doing, being on the worst show in the world, uh, obviously it never went to series. Uh, it was just terrible. Um, but I learned a lot from it and it also led to you know, the best opportunity that I had in my career at that time. That was your first time setting fire to trees as well. <laughs> yes, I've never done that before. Um, actually, David Copping, who was the first assistant, explained how he did it. You, you just wrap the, um, the bark in petroleum jelly 
and you set fire to the petroleum jelly. Um, and so it, the, the trees are fire. Um, he had these strange sayings like wagons roll. He also had another one that after we're doing a shoot with smoke everywhere, he would yell out, save, save the smoke. I don't know how you're supposed to do that. And I yelled back, what I'm supposed to do, put it in my pocket. But basically what you did was you got a, we had a, a fireproof blanket. So you wrap it around the, the tree trunk and the, the um, it, it stops the oxygen getting to the flames. And so it puts the fire out. And then the tree is totally untouched and you can recover it with petroleum jelly and do take two. Wow, great story. <laughs> 1976, Hilton Bonner approached you to write a pantomime, a children's one, and you wrote Cinderella, but put a few of your own touches on it, which was actually used in the tunnel episode of Prisoner with the Great Escape. Can you tell us much about the pantomime? Well, you know, the back in those days, English traditional pantomime, everybody knows about, but there, there was an industry going around here where every school holiday tra traveling troops of shows would do pantomimes or kid shows or whatever and Hilton was a quite a good singer um, and he'd appeared in a lot of these um, pantomimes and he decided that the people running the show were making a lot more money than he was so he'd put one on himself again it was and he knew where to go because he'd been to all the theatres as a, an actor and singer. He knew where to get the costumes from the Melbourne Theatre Company. What he didn't know was how to manage anything. So when he asked me to write the script, I'd already worked for him previously on a production he'd done at the, of the Beggar's Opera and never got paid. So this time I said, no, hold on, how am I, you're going to pay me up front. But of course he didn't have the money. And he said, no, what if you, if you're, uh, if you're worried about getting paid, you can manage the troupe. So you'll collect the money yourself as we go from theatre to theatre. So I went from being a, a writer to a tour manager. Um, and the tour was a huge success. Um, but uh, subsequent, but, but it was a complete bun fight to sort of get out of the money and, and chase around. Uh, and when Hilton said he'd do another tour, in New South Wales, I declined, which is just as well because that was the exact time that they they phoned me up and offered me the job at Grundy's. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Do you um do you actually remember the first television script you wrote and sold? Well, it was one and the same, Ken. Um, as I explained earlier, uh, I became mates with a guy called David Copping. He was head of uh, ABC drama and uh, his daughter was Lisa Goddard the uh, actress who was in Skippy uh, and I used to spend weekends quite often at their house up in Avalon and he came home one Friday looking very tired and he threw a script down on my lap and said look at this this is what they're, they're giving me for the new show and I read it I've never read a script before in my life. I said, yeah, yeah, it does seem pretty ordinary. I, I think I could do better than this. And he said, okay, we'll have a go. Um, <laughs> and he said, but I can't sell it for you because I can't be seen to be interfering. So uh, I got a, um, an actor called Stan Walsh. And we went in to see the producer and uh, got a commission to write a script. I got a commission to write a script. He got a commission to... Be, be an actor in the show uh, and I, then I had to buy a, a typewriter because I, I hadn't actually written any scripts before so I bought the typewriter I was working as an accountant at the time and I wrote it at night and the most memorable piece of the writing experience was that I was working late at night to get it finished and meet the deadline uh, by the light of a stand, huge standard lamp and as I was sitting there at about two in the morning, very tired, I looked up and on the wall in front of me was the shadow of the biggest spider you've ever seen. It covered the wall. Um, and what I, what I realized is it was a huntsman spider on the lampshade. And I 
immediately jumped up and took off my shoe and beat it to death. Um, uh, although I understand they're they're quite harmless, but it just terrified me. The, the 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 sort of postscript to that was I sold the, they bought the script and basically took it as was and said that they were going to series and that I could write on the series the following year um, so I resigned from my job as a, an accountant um, but when I turned up to get my commission for my second script other more professional and more fleet of foot writers and jumped in and got all the commissions for the few weeks that the show ran. And it only ran a few few weeks, it was awful. It was called Something Else. And the basic idea was that it was a pub, based in a pub that had a band, that had band and dances. So it was a sort of little comedy about life in the pub intercut with the local rock and roll bands and a different guest band every night. It was called Something Else. And I remember the, uh, the review uh, six on my mind is don't give us something else, give us anything else. So it wasn't <laughs> great. <laughs> That's funny. Um, getting onto Grundy's via Alan Coleman offered you $400 a week to start with Grundy's, but you asked for 600 a week because you heard they were inclined to pay staff little as possible. You weren't really wanting to go to Grundy's at the time. Is that right? Yeah, look, I Grundy's at that time they 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 were they were making early evening very low budget shows, and one of them was the Young Doctors. They they sold three months of it to Channel Nine. Channel Nine cancelled it, but they also put it to air, and it was so popular with the public and with the advertisers that they felt they had to re. Uh, recommence making the show again. Oh, well, I never knew. But, yeah, but apparently the first three months have been such a bum fight. You know, they were they made it in a tin shed in in North Sydney, um, and they were working from six in the morning till two in the morning to get the show through. Uh, they used the crew from the cricket came in with their OB van to shoot it. It really was basic television. But be, the sum total of that was that the first assistant decided he didn't want to come back and do it again. Uh, one of the directors was Max Farnell, who I, who directed Kerbo the Koala and who I'd also been first assistant with on the, on the golfing documentary. And he phoned me up and asked if I would take the job. Now, I'm pretty certain they'd offered just about every experienced floor manager in the country um, and, and been turned down because it was such a tough gig. So I thought, well, I don't want to let Max down, besides which he may never offer me a job again if I do that. So I turned up and I, I asked around how much money they, they paid. Uh, and I was told by an ABC um, floor manager, director friend of mine that sort of top whack was $400 a week. So I listened to the pitch about the show told Alan that you know, it sounded like a really tough job. I'm sure I could do it, but I'd need $600. And to my surprise, instead of saying, no, that's too much, he said, fine, can you start on Monday? <laughs> that's how desperate they were. Well, I'd never been a floor manager in my life. Um, I turned up on the Monday with my scripts, um, uh, get to rehearsal, and I just, everything that the director said, and it was Max Arnell, I just wrote down on the side of my script where the cameras were, what the movements were, I just wrote it all down. Um, and then when we came to the next day, we, we rehearsed that day, and the next day we shot an hour of television in one day. There you are, Ken, not, not easy stuff like you were used to. An hour of television in one day, but I basically had it all just there on, on the page. And I don't think anybody suspected that I'd never been a floor manager before. And it, and it, it worked pretty well. The, the other thing was, again, you're working on a show where, where they shot it in sequence. There was no editing. So every time they'd shoot a scene, then they'd move to the next set, shoot that scene, move to the next set. What I found out very early on was that some of the sets were set in the same place. So for example, if you had a, a scene in a, 
hospital ward and a scene in the operating theater, you had to stop and redress the set before you could do the next scene. And if you had the next scene in the hospital ward, you had to stop and redress it again to do it again. Now, pretty simple stuff. I went up to Grundy House to see the script department, lovely guy called Peter Connor and, and Betty Quinn were, were the whole script department. There were only two of them. And I said, look, if you could just stop putting these scenes in these sets together, then we could speed up production because we can redress sets while we're shooting somewhere else, just like Z cars. Um, so I wasn't inventing the wheel. I was just drawing on what I'd already learned. And I said, I know that the scripts are all written weeks in advance, but uh, you know, if you could do this from now on, it would be really helpful. And Peter Connor said to me, oh, don't worry about that, Ian, we can do it from now. And he took the script apart, shuffled the scenes so that they, <laughs> there were no scenes from the same location, the same place, clipped it together and said, OK, we'll shoot it in that sequence now. So from then on, we never had to wait while they redress sets and we and it, uh, it all ran very smoothly. Wow, that's awesome. You, um, you eventually apparently decided that you'd had enough and that's when Reg Watson told you, you he'd finished writing a script for a drama in women's in a woman's prison. But was the first script that Reg wrote different from the first episode we saw back in 1979? And was it always going to be called Prisoner? Uh, well, there, there, there are several bits to that. I, I guess Prisoner audience are probably most interested in the, how it pertains to Prisoner. Um, it, the script he wrote is exactly the script that we produced. Um, but as you know, lots of people claim to be responsible for the uh, success of the show, and, uh, and I'm one of them. Um, because what happened was he, you work for Channel 10, if you remember just before Prisoner was produced. The successful shows, the adult serials that um, Channel 10 had were number 96, which was not surprisingly 69 upside down. And The Box, which is a pretty clear image about television. They were both essentially soft porn shows. And they 10 subscribed to a company called Tape, who said the most successful shows you could make would be either women in prison or nuns on an island. Um, <laughs> they settled for the women in prison. But obviously what they were expecting was a show that was like number 96, where the, the glamorous people and suddenly women take their clothes off for no reason and a couple of men are in bed together. They bought something that I certainly didn't know about because I, I wasn't privy to these discussions. But then they asked Reg Watson to write it. Now, Reg is a past master at writing early evening television. He's fantastic. I mean, he's the crossroads in England, young doctors, neighbors. But every time he attempted to do a show that would go to air after 7.30, it didn't work because he, he didn't think in that way. And he certainly didn't want to write, write a soft porn show for, for Channel 10. So what he did was he got a girl from uh, the Australian Film and Television School to research prisons and come up with a whole set of anecdotes of things that had happened in prison. They came up with a, a woman who was having a sexual affair with a plumber, um, a woman who'd hung herself, the way people attacked innocent people if they thought they, or, or anybody they thought had hurt children and whatever. And Reg just simply put these incidents together. But he didn't really have any idea of what he was gonna do with the show afterwards. And so when he gave me the script to read, I read it and think, you know, all the incidents are terrific, the character, okay. But I don't quite understand why is Vera so awful? You know, why is Frankie so awful? What's, what's wrong with these people? And I went to Reg and said, no, I'm really interested in it, but can you explain to me 
why these women behave like that. And he said, oh, women do things like that. <laughs> and I thought, well, not in my experience. Um, but also, that's terrific, because if he hasn't got a background for these women, if he hasn't created real characters, then I can do that. I can, I can, I can give uh, Vera the invalid mother at home that she's trapped by, or I can give um, subsequently Meg's husband being killed in the prison. I can create all the characters as I like. Um, so I so I agreed to take it over, but basically I wanted to take it over. And he said, well, my his contract was to write episodes one and two. He'd written one. He told me that in episode two, B and mum would be released and mum's family would reject her and she would want to come back into prison and B would shoot her husband because he'd let their daughter die. That was it. That was his entire description of episode two. Uh, and then I got together with writers, uh, Denise Morgan and, uh, and Michael Brindley. I wrote episodes three and four. They together wrote episodes five, six, seven. And I wrote, ep wrote episode nine because I don't know if you remember Ken or Matt, but in episode nine, we sort of got back to the story of why Lynn was innocent and, the, and went back to the location. And we had, obviously had to shoot that all in one go because we couldn't afford to go there twice. So I writ, I'd written episodes two to nine before Reg actually gave me episode two or three to nine. So all the incidents that were in those episodes were still there and, and exactly the same. And that's what we shot but none of them had any influence on where the show went subsequently, because that was something that I sat down and worked out with, uh, with, my, with my writers, particularly Denise Morgan, who was uh, particularly attuned to the show, given that she was gay, um, she'd grown up in a country town. She had really understood the, the difficulties that women have in in society and the prejudices and whatever. So she was able to turn what were just caricatures in the pilot like Frankie uh, into real people. It was Denise who came up with the idea that Frankie would be illiterate. You know, we, we turned them into real people. So and I, I think that was really important because it gave the actors something to work on. Yeah. We also developed the, the theme of the show, which was basically everybody's a prisoner including the prison officers uh, and the heroes are the ones who overcome their difficulty and the villains are the ones who take out their frustrations on everybody else. Now, that was something we developed from episode three on. We also developed a balance for the show. What was obvious was you wanted the audience to have empathy or sympathy for the people who came into the show. And of course, they're all prisoners. So they've obviously all done something wrong. Now, you want to give them, you want the audience to like them. So there has to be a reason why they've done something wrong. And there has to be a reason why something goes bad for them when they come into the prison. And so and that would either be they're dealing with the staff or they're dealing with the other prisoners. So what we did was, or what I did was create one good prison officer, one bad prison officer, one good tough prisoner, one bad tough prisoner. And these people affected everybody else's stories. So without them, if the women, if the prisoners were in trouble, that was their problem. Um, with them, you could see that they were given the chance for redemption by the, by the good side and they were, their, their futures were threatened by the bad side. And it, gave the whole show a balance, which we maintained for certainly all the time that I was there, although it was later abandoned. Uh, and as I say, uh, we used, when I came back, I left the show and when I came back, the, ba the balance had been ab ab abandoned. So I created the freak character to replace the evil prison officer and the evil criminal in one so that we got the balance of the show back again. 
and that's I think that's really what it what made the show in the, that everybody could identify with the people and they all had a reason for things going wrong rather than just being stupid. I actually want to talk to you a bit further about um, Joan Ferguson shortly, but um, yeah. going back a little bit. So you took the job as producer, story producer and co-writer and you wrote 22 episodes on Prisoner and you were the producer and executive producer of 160 episodes. So can you just tell for the fans what the difference is between producer and executive producer is? Well, actually, you, you could uh, we could do a whole podcast on this one, Matt, if you like. I think we need um, to make a, a, a sequel. <laughs> yeah, uh, because really the, the roles of producer and executive producer have changed enormously over the years. Back in the golden days of Hollywood, uh, you know, with the studio system, the producer was the creative force behind the show. You know, you see Daryl Epp, Z, uh, Daryl Zanuck movies. He was the producer, and the executive producer was the man who got him the money. So he was responsible for the content. The executive producer was responsible for the money. Simple. You get to about 1970, and the French come up with the auteur theory, which is that the director was also the writer and the creative head. And under that theory, the producer becomes more or less a production manager and the executive producer still remains the, uh, the money man. But for television, in particularly serial television, we couldn't move to that model, although lots of directors tried to make it happen. The truth is, I mean, for something like Prisoner, I was the only producer for the first three years. And in fact, I did another six months later. I don't think you gave me credit for that when you mentioned the hours, but uh, it would be impossible for have the directors in charge of the creatively in charge because they changed every week. The show would have changed every week. So back in those days, the thing was that the producer was the creative controller and the executive producer was the money man. These days, uh, they tend to break up the thing. Uh, my daughter's a, a script producer. Uh, they, they have on Neighbours these days a script producer who is charged creatively of the script. And they have two more producers who are actually responsible creatively for the, uh, the various episodes week on week. And then, of course, they have to have somebody over that who has an overall view. So the executive producer becomes the creative head of the show. So basically, they've got three people doing the job that, that I did on my own. Uh, and that doesn't actually make it easier, because if you're doing it on your own, you make a decision and there's no one to argue with you. But if you've got four people doing the same job, all with different ideas, they spend more time working out what they should agree on than they, than they do on getting on with it. Does your daughter ever come to you for, I mean, to have you as her dad? <laughs> I mean, does she have uh, ideas on um, stories? <laughs> 30 days. Um, yeah, that's, that's true, she did. And she went through a quite interesting evolution. Initially, she was going to be an actress, um, but she simply didn't like people telling her how to perform. <laughs> you know, she wasn't a good actress. So then she decided that she wanted to decide how what the performance was so she'd be a director. And then she found she didn't like that particularly. So she went to the film and television school and did a writing course, all not connected me, with me at all. Um, and in fact, was plucked out of the writing, writing class by her lecturer who happened to be the story editor on Neighbours at the time saying, you're wasting your time here at school, come and Oh. Come and do it. Oh. And so she did the script department. So she pretty much developed her career on her own. Amazing. That's not to say that when she runs into a problem or when she ran into problems, particularly early on, she wouldn't phone up and say, Dad, this is <laughs> this has happened. Uh, and then we'd have a three way conversation with with Annie as well, who's experienced in the business, and we'd, yeah. we'd discuss experiences. But creatively she gets nothing from me she does it all herself and my son's also a director writer stroke editor 
um, hyphen. They both ended up in the business, but not with any encouragement from me. Okay. <laughs> Although it was originally intended as a one hour a week series, um, whose decision was it to make it two hours per week? And did you agree with that? And what were the benefits and negatives of two hours of prisoner, if there were any? Right, okay. We should go back, I think, Ken, to the creation of the show, because um, you worked there at the time. The network were expecting something very different to the pilot that I delivered to them. They had number 96 in their head. They actually brought an expert over from America I think she was off Days of Our Lives or something, I can't remember. But she came over and she said, she looked at it and, and they, the network got me in and said, these women are too ugly. They don't wear enough makeup. Their dresses are too loose. Um, they're not sexy enough. And, I, and the whole show runs much too fast. It's much too, too dramatic. She actually said to me that, uh, they had the storylines for Days of Our Lives plotted two years in advance. Uh, and I asked her if she wrote them on the back of a stamp because I figured that's how much plot they had in two years. Of it. And she burst into tears and went home. But basically what it meant was I was at war with the network. I was making the show that I conceived and they, were, they wanted to buy a show that I hadn't conceived. Now, Usually in this argument, certainly in these days and subsequently, the network's bound to win the argument. But I was a young, brash guy, so I wasn't going to give in. Fortunately, I had an ally at Channel 10, a guy called Neil Harold, um, who was head of production. You, you remember him, Ken? He, he was a good guy. He, he, was, he was the most honourable television executive I think I ever worked with. And he took me in and he said, look, I like the show, my wife likes the show, my secretary likes the show, what are we going to do? And I said, well, why don't you persuade them to leave us alone and go and do some market research? And just get a company in to research whether it'll, what the audience for the show will be. And he did that, and so they left us alone. And I moved on as quickly as I could <clears throat> we produced five episodes so because I figured if I got enough episodes in the can, um, if they ever come around and say we want to change it, it'll be too late. That was my thinking. But then I then I uh, uh, my plan basically worked too well because they did the market research, and at that time we were supposed to be making sixteen hours of a series. They did the market research, and the market research was so enormous. The figures were so big that they got that they were going to get for ratings. But they immediately came back and said, we don't want 16 hours anymore. We want 52 hours. We want them two hours a week, not one hour a week. So it, it was driven by the audience, really. The audience wanted the show. The network wanted the show. What, I was actually, what ran through your head when they asked for that? Did you start? I was aghast, absolutely aghast. In fact, I was overseas. I'd taken Annie back to England to meet my family. Um, and Reg Watson phoned up and said, we're going to two hours a week and we've got to start straight away. And I, for 24 hours, didn't respond because I was thinking, I'll go back to England. I'm not going to do this. Um, <laughs> you'd remember, we, I mean, shows like episode three, it's so complicated to make. You couldn't make two hours of that every week. Actresses like um, Carol Burns took enormous amount of time and effort to get her performance right. And you couldn't do that two hours a week. <clears throat> so my, my first impression was, uh, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna bother with this. And then I thought this show is gonna be a huge success and some other bugger is gonna take credit for it. So no, I will go back. So I came back to, came back to Australia persuaded them to delay the switch from one hour a week to two hours for several weeks so that I could readjust the show. Um, and, uh, and then we went on. The disadvantages of going two hours a week is, use, is simply time, you know, and that's just time in script, in production or whatever. And the fact that you go through stories very quickly. So the first thing we had to do was to re 
configure the concept. All the first episodes are about individual prisoners and their, their predicament. After episode 13, what we did was the, the regular actors like B and Meg and Vera, and hopefully Frankie it was supposed to be, but we, we actually lost her because she wouldn't work it two hours a week, would become constant characters. They wouldn't change again. They would become what they were at that moment. Yeah. And then they would be the people off whom all the other stories bounced because they affected everybody else's stories without being affected themselves, without changing themselves. So we had to change the concept. We had to chop the first scene off of every episode from two right through to, to 11 and stick it on the end of the previous episode because we had a teaser at the beginning of the, the show. Each episode finished. There was no teaser. There's no reason to come back. Oh. Um, but the first scene was a teaser about what was going to be happening in the next hour. So we picked up the first scene off of each episode and put it on the previous episode so that we ended up with a, with a teaser. So we reshaped it like that. Then I had the problem of persuading the cast who really cared about the show that, that they'd be happy to go and do two hours a week. And they knew this was you know, going to be very tough. In the end, only Carol decided she wouldn't um, do two hours a week. And so we did the story of her escaping. It meant whilst they were doing two hours a week, she only worked on location. Uh, and then she worked out her contract working on location and then we killed her off. We actually used um, the, the Gaffney character as her replacement in the show so that we, we kept the balance of the show with the villains and the, and the heroes amongst prisoners and, and, uh, and staff. That actually brings me to my next question to ask you is about your, uh, your four pillar. Uh, yeah, well, that, that basically was it. You see, and I don't know whether we've covered it or we will cover it, but I, I, actually, I actually ran out of ideas. When we, when we produced the first 150, 160 hours of television, I was the story producer, as well as the producer and sometimes the writer, which basically meant that I came up with all the ideas with input from other writers and with research. But, but the, the fundamental was that um, we couldn't do stories where, as happens in most soap operas, the characters do the same thing over and over again. You've seen shows where they, you know, that this happens all the time. And, and, I, and we were in danger of getting that. We, when I was overseas, uh, they actually, Reg Watson actually storylined episodes 13 and 14 and released Karen, uh, Marilyn, um, Lynn uh, out of prison and had Doreen and Frankie on the run. I mean, they <laughs> he took everybody out of prison. I don't know where the show, show was going to go after that. So we had to cancel that. But basically what it meant was it was inc wasn't credible for me that we could have prisoners for whom so many things would happen to them. So instead of having the principal characters as the ones who were the ones who had stories happen to them, we brought in guest stories, long-term guests. The stories happened to them and the four pillars, the, the good staff, the bad staff, the good prisoner, the bad prisoner, affected their stories and guided their stories. So it was a combination between the old series idea, you know, in the old series that the Americans make um, where the characters never change. Yeah. We, we tried to do that with having development for all the, the new characters that came through. Fantastic. We covered the, um, about the two hours per week, which was going to be Ken's next question. So my next question was um, about Graham Arthur and Rod Hardy, who were the initial directors on the show. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah. As I explained to you, a lot of people in, in Melbourne didn't want to work on Prisoner because of, of Crawford's. But I, I just spent my time searching through old shows and looking for the best directors I could find. Uh, and Graham and Rod were the best two directors I could find, judging by their work, who were also prepared to work for me because they currently weren't favorites of Hector Crawford. So 
we we really we we met at the first production meeting. We we didn't uh, we weren't friends or anything, but uh, they were enormously instrumental in making the show a success. Um, Graham, in particular, had a great talent for getting everybody to work, bringing everybody in. He he was he had a a wonderful thing. He he worked out, for example it would be possible to put a shot in the first episode, a, a traveling shot, which picked up Karen being inducted, took her through the, um, the corridor down the center, went through the cells on either side and through to the laundry all in one shot. And I said, why are you doing this? And he said, the crew won't think we can do it. So if we do it, They'll all be so pleased with themselves that the whole show will, will get a, a great fillet. And he was right. Everybody was trying to do things after that rather than simply going through the motions of making things. Now, tragically, um, Graham had a hole in his heart and he died during the Christmas break that we first started. And uh, we were shared, we were in, a, in the same block. And uh, we were up all, the night before we came back to resume production. Um, we, we spent with his wife, who we only recently married, uh, and out of the hospital, and then, and then he died. And then I had to go in and tell the, the cast that um, Graham wouldn't be uh, directing anymore uh, and find a replacement. And, and he was an enormous loss. Rod's contribution to the show was different. I mean, technically, Rod was terrific. Episode three was an example of the, the riot. I mean, it is such a complex show. To make that in one hour with multiple cameras, you know, was just fantastic. He was probably, along with Marcus Cole and maybe Mark Joffa, one of the best directors I ever worked with. Sadly, I never worked with him again after Prisoner. He did, in fact, come to me with a from points with a feature film uh, called Van Dies Indecent Obsession, which we eventually made. But he um, was adamant that the film was set on an island. He wanted to shoot it on an island, uh, which I agreed to, and we set it up on Lord Howe Island. Uh, then he was adamant that the, the main character, he wanted a matinee idol, and he wanted an English actor to... Uh, to play the part and equity wouldn't let the actor in um, and rather than direct it with another actor he wanted us to hold up the whole production and unfortunately at the end I had to say Rod you have to use an Australian actor or else you have to go so we never worked again because he uh, he had to go and, and that was really hard I mean we were really good friends by that time yeah. you know I was at a wedding and I remember coming away from the meeting when I told him that he he was fired and I was about a 20k drive back to our office and I cried all the way home. It was really, really sad. And we've never worked together since. He then, uh, as you would expect, sort of moved to Hollywood and, uh, and got a feature film career there. Yes, I've got fond, fond memories of both Graham and, and Rod. Graham, probably the other thing that he would have uh, had in mind uh, regarding the travelling shot that you mentioned was that the pubs would probably close in, you know, close to. <laughs> no, I, 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 look, the man is dead. I don't think you can say that sort of thing. But, but he, he certainly liked to drink. He, he lived very hard. And I think that was because he knew he wasn't going to be here for a long time. He was here for a good time. He had the whole of the heart. I think he knew that he wasn't going to survive. And he was a great player. Um, and that was a great release for me. When we went down to Melbourne and things were so tough, it was great to have somebody as sociable as Graham to uh, spend your time with. Uh, Lizzie, um, dear old Lizzie, was an extra on the pilot and, and yep. Denise Morgan changed her to, to one of the most beloved characters on the show. Was Denise, in fact, responsible for creating Lizzie Birdsworth? And what are your memories of working with the legendary Sheila? Well, I, I, my memories of working with the legendary sealer is that her bottles of stout used to be found, empty bottles of stout used to be found behind the set all the time. Um, 
Denise took several characters who were already there, Lizzie and Frankie being the main two, and then imbued them with depth and personality that they never had. Um, we actually got a backstory for Lizzie from the research that had been done. But Denise was the one who turned her into a whole person. You might notice that in episode three, for example, she's on the side of the bad guys. She's, she's with Frank. And that, that was a, a sign that at that stage, Denise hadn't come onto the show, um, but she saw the character uh, and decided that she wanted to uh, develop her. She had a great thing for the underdog. She developed both uh, the characters. And of course, she was pretty anti the idea that Frankie was just a sort of caricature of Butch Dyke. And she turned her into a, into a real person by giving her uh, a background and also by having her fall in love with Karen, uh, which, was, which was good. The thing I most remember about working with Sheila Florence is when Denise created the character of Lizzie, and we, we hadn't cast her at this stage, she put in a, her storyline, a story where Frankie steals her teeth. I don't know if you remember that in the fifth or sixth episode. Um, and so I was searching desperately in, Aust in Melbourne for an actress of a certain age with certain wrinkles who had, didn't have her own teeth. And uh, very strange, as soon as I saw Sheila Florence, I thought, oh, she's perfect. And I've sort of spent the whole interview sort of trying to look into her mouth to see whether there were her own teeth. In the end, I had to ask her, I said, I'm sorry, Sheila, this part requires somebody taking their teeth out. Do you have false teeth? And she said, oh, yes, there, you know, she was. But I'm not sure that she ever really forgave me that because <laughs> when, when new actresses would come into the show, she would say to them, you know that Ian Bradley, he's a bugger. You know, you want to be careful of him. You know what he made me do to get this part? He made me take all my teeth out. <laughs> so Sheila was pretty much like Lizzie, really, wasn't she? Very yeah. much. Yeah. Very much so, except that she could uh, occasionally go into her toffee mode where she, uh, she trod the boards and... Uh, that kind of thing. Yes. Well, she was a granddad of the, of the theatre. One of the advantages for me in casting the show was I worked in Sydney. Um, and so when I came down to Melbourne to cast the show, I didn't know any of the local actresses. Um, back in those days, they were pretty much separate industries. So, I mean, I don't think, you know, maybe a granddad of the stage like Sheila would have been anybody else's first choice to play a so criminal but she was perfect for it I just I just saw the people in front of me and decided they're perfect for the role and then later found that some of them were actors who've never worked professionally and others were ones with long and distinguished careers but that wasn't the point I was trying to create the characters not to worry about what they'd done before. So you had the first interview with them um, with Sheila bringing her onto the show. Yeah we um, Lizzie was a character who was quite late, late to be cast because it's not an easy role. Yeah. Um, and in fact, uh, we were already into production, into pre-production when I was searching through actresses of a certain age um, and not really getting anywhere. And then she walked in and I thought, I don't have to stop looking anymore. We'll, we'll even rewrite the script to bite our teeth if necessary, but uh, this is it. <laughs> The, um, the next thing I want to talk about was Carol. We've spoken about Carol Burns a few times with, with Ken in yeah. episode one and um, Gerard in episode two. So she was based on a real life person called Sandra Nelson, who was in Sydney, an inmate. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's sort of right. Um, as I said to you, uh, Reg based the stories on, on research. And at the time that uh, he was writing Prisoner, Sandra Nelson was the longest serving female prisoner in New South Wales. Um, and her back sto her story was that she dis discovered she was lesbian as a teenager. She fell in love with a girl who fell in love with her, but the girl's parents insisted that the girl marry a man and took her away from her. And she got so angry 
that she, after meeting the girls, she, she got into a taxi to uh, to go to drive away, and she actually beat the taxi driver to death simply because he was a man and he was there at the wrong time. Do we have time for a funny story about that? Um, because she she was um, she was the inspiration for Frankie, uh, but also by the time we got to actually producing the show, she'd been released from prison and she did a lot of work in prisoner reform and halfway houses and whatever. And this seemed to me to be a terrific source of research and for future storylines. As you know, we brought the halfway house in later. The problem was that she was in Sydney out on parole and she couldn't leave Melbourne. Um, but we got special permission for her to fly down to Melbourne in the morning had a meeting with her with the, all the writers and myself, and then fly her back. But she had to be back in Sydney that, that day as a term of her parole. Well, she turned up and she was still obviously quite damaged. Why wouldn't she be? She'd been in prison for 30 years. She was coming to grips with being out. This is the first time she'd been out of the state ever. And so she was quite nervous, but also very, much able to to express her feelings and the stories that she wanted and she was a wonderful source of stories and she told us about the halfway house as well as the difficulties of being released from prison after all so long and whatever and we actually based the betty bobbitt june character on her oh really on one side of her and and uh, because she was basically two different people she was the she was the woman who'd been who'd beaten a taxi driver to death and she was the woman into prison reform. So we, we used her for both characters. The interesting thing was that she worked, she, she was so interesting that we went, ran over time on our meeting and my secretary came in and said, we've called a taxi, but it's not here. And they say there's traffic problems. <sighs> and she got very nervous saying, I have to be at the airport, I have to get on the plane. And I said, don't worry, I've done this trip a hundred times because I'm always flying up and down. Get in the car and I'll drive you to the airport. And what I didn't think, of course, was that the last time that she'd been alone in a car with a man, she'd beaten him to death. <laughs> but that wasn't in my mind as we drove off towards the airport. And as we're driving towards the airport, and the traffic was getting bad and I thought, oh, I'll take a shortcut. Now, on the road that I was about to take the shortcut up above in front of me was a big sign saying to the airport. And I turned left to go down the side street and I felt her grip the seat. So she obviously thought, he's not taking me to the airport. The airport's that way. Where is he going? And I suddenly thought, shit, if she gets angry, she might beat me to death. <laughs> so I, I said, it's all right. It's all right, Sandra. This is a shortcut. And I kept talking and talking and talking, and she was still gripping their wow. right hand in the seat all the way until we came back out onto the entrance to the, the freeway to the airport, and she saw airport up ahead. And then she relaxed a little. I didn't. Um, I drove her to the airport. I pulled up outside the airport. She got out and, got, and left without even saying goodbye and without... And I thought, I, I wonder who was the more nervous on this flight, on this uh, trip, whether it was Sandy or myself. But the, the funny point was she, she went back to Sydney, she spoke to the, um, the researcher, and the researcher said, how was the trip in England, in, in Victoria? And she said, all the women asked very clever questions, and all the men asked stupid questions. <laughs> so I don't know whether, and I think the most stupid thing I did was offer to drive her back to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you also hired a storyliner for Prisoner who was uh, a male ex-inmate. Can you tell us something about him uh, and, and did you get any interesting stories? Yeah, and his name was Peter Brennan and he was a, a Sydney rugby league player who got injured back in the days when they didn't get pensions. So what he used to do was to fly down to Melbourne hire a car, go to a bank, rob a bank, go back to the airport and come. And he did this several times, but one time his luck ran out and the police caught him and there was a gunfight and all the rest of it. 
and his recounting of it was it was very funny because all the people you expect people to dive for cover when this happens but they didn't they all stood and watched because they thought they were recording homicide or something you know but anyway he he went to prison then whilst he was in prison he took a, a writing course and he put in an application to be a, a writer he wasn't good enough to be a writer but it seemed to me that uh, he had a wealth of stories and experience that would be useful in the storyline meetings not necessarily as a source of stories but to give attitudes and make the stories work which he did and then subsequently Grundy's made a series about a male prison called Punishment I got him the job as storyliner on that and of course he was he went up to Sydney to become a storyliner that but that show didn't run all that long and he didn't actually enjoy the experience I didn't see him again until sort of for another 10 years. And I was making a show called The Great Bookie Robbery. And one of the characters in The Great Bookie Robbery was a master criminal. But everybody didn't, every, everybody had different ideas about whether he was a master criminal or not. But the guy who said he was said you could tell he was a master criminal by the place he lived in. He lived in a place with a glass front so he could see if any place anybody was coming close to him in a suburb with lots and lots of exits, exits out the side. You get inside his house and there'd be nothing personal in there because it's all set up ready to run at any moment. And so I, I told the art director, this is what I was looking for. And he came back and said, I found exactly the place you're looking for. And the bloke who lives there knows you. And his name is Peter Squires. And I said, I don't know any Peter Squires. But anyway, he phoned me up and it was Peter Brennan. Oh. Uh, and I thought, well, obviously he's back in a life of crime, although he claimed, in fact, to be on a setting timeshare of apartments on the on the Barrier Reef. But he was back uh, as a criminal. After we'd finished making the Great Bookie Robbery, I was in Paris and I got a phone call from the press saying, we understand that um, Peter Brennan used to work with you. He's just been shot dead in an armed holdup in in Melbourne. Do you think his time working on Prisoner affected him as a, <laughs> and caused him to become an armed robber? And I said, hang on a second, he was an armed robber long before he met me. I probably delayed this by 10 years. But uh, yeah, that, that was Peter. I think with the right handling, he could have gone on and had quite a successful career in the business. But uh, unfortunately, he was working on a fairly unhappy show at Punishment, and, he, and that didn't happen. What was one of the uh, the great standout story ideas that he gave you for Prisoner that you used? He, di he didn't give us storylines. Okay. He, he, no, he, what he did was explain what people would do if, if a certain situation okay. happened. You know, so he, he would give you, give you credible responses in order to make sure the, the story went in a way that, that made sense. Channel O or O10, became yeah. the ex exterior set for Prisoner, but that wasn't the first choice, we think. What other locations might have been used for Wentworth and who created and designed the interior set layout? Yeah, well, the answer to uh, what places, other places were available to us uh, is twofold. When I came down to Melbourne and went searching through disused mental hospitals and, and closed down prisons looking for a location. Um, but then I was told by Neil Harold that there was absolutely no money for locations. So uh, it, it wasn't a matter of choice that we use the, the studio as the prison. It was a matter of necessity. We just couldn't afford to go anywhere else. And once we'd made the decision that the prison, that the television station was the was the prison, then that also dictated what the interior sets looked like because it was all red brick and all the rest of it. And I don't know if you remember, you had a production designer called Ian Costello. Yes. And when we did the scripts, I, I gave him a list of all of the sets that we would need in order to run the first 16 hours of the show. And I went down to look at his drawings and all the drawings were perfect. They, they were exactly right. But the problem was he placed all the sets around the corner, around the edges of the studio. 
so that it was impossible to go from one set to another. And basically, um, I just said, well, what we want is, I drew a big H down the middle of his plan and said, if you put a corridor down there and turn all the sets around so that you can, get, you can shoot outside in the corridor and inside in, in the office and you can move the people through, then I'm perfectly happy with your designs. Uh, and that's what he did. It, he, um, he was very diligent, Ian, and, uh, but not really very experienced. I remember he also built all the sets initially too tall for the lighting grid. <laughs> he couldn't move the lights because the sets were taller than the lights at the saw the top of the sets. But um, uh, yeah, that, it was, I mean, basically I came up with the idea because we weren't going to be able to go on location and have interiors as I would have liked. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you would normally shoot on location, going through corridors, going in and out of buildings, all this, we had to do in the set itself, on the stage itself, because we just didn't have the money to go anywhere else. So going back to the uh, saying to do the H, so that's how obviously yeah. the name H block. Yeah. <laughs> uh, H block is uh, is actually a real term for from I think Pentridge, um, you know, it's where the hardened criminals live, but that's why we uh, we had prisoner cell block H, um, and the, the, we only called it cell block H because of ATV in England objecting to us setting the show as prisoner because they had the prisoner with Magoon out. And I think they did eight episodes of that. I, mean, I, I, I really liked the show, but I really didn't think that they were entitled to uh, demand a change in our name because of a, an eight episode show that was never repeated. Can we, can we talk about the story about the, uh, the bars and the, on the outside of the building? How you, your idea? Oh, look, again, this is, this is all driven by money. When I agreed to or suggested that we use the studio as the prison, it was required, obviously, that there were windows and bars in the um, in the set, and I got a call from Neil Harold saying we can't afford windows, and I said this is ridiculous. So I'll come out and have a look. And what, as you know, there's a huge wall, and the intention from the plans from the production designer was that they were going to build an identical wall in front of it with windows in it, so they could put bars in. And I said, you know, it's going to cost 60,000, which we didn't have. And I said, no, no, that's ridiculous. All we want is a light box with bars on that will look like windows and just stick it on the existing wall. It wasn't perhaps as good as having a new wall with real holes in and real room behind for act actors to hide. But I mean, we, we were working on a tight budget. My budget for Prisoner, um, as you know, Ken, the network provided the technical crew, but my, my budget for the creative crew, crew and for the scripts and for the actors and all this was $54,000 a week, which is 54,000 for two hours. Wow. You know, so it, we had just, we just had no money. Um, and though, therefore lots of the decisions made like using the studio as the prison, sticking light boxes on the uh, wall and even using the interior studio stairs as staircases. They were just all driven by a lack of money. Was there ever a point when you were using this, this you know, you come up with the idea to use a studio to think that it's just not going to work, shooting a prison in a studio? No, no, I'm actually almost the opposite. Ken will tell you that uh, Channel 10 was like a prison. <laughs> it had all, all those cyclone fences around it. It had tunnels underneath where um, supposedly the, uh, the audiences used to come into studios, but we turned into green rooms. The women lived in green rooms, in, you know, with no lateral light and then came up into the studio with no lateral light. It was like they were in prison, you know, that it, it actually added to the claustrophobic feeling of it. I never had any doubt that we were going to get the right sort of attitude and the, the right sort of obvious from working in the in Channel 10, because to me, it always felt like a prison. That's great. 
Ken and I, in the first episode that we did, to, Ken and I did together, we spoke about how Prisoner was syndicated into eight major US towns in the 1980s and one being New York as well. And it was actually rating better than the Johnny Carson show at the time, which yeah. had 22 million viewers. How, how did that make you feel that, that a show like Prisoner out of Australia was rating better than the Johnny Carson show? Um, ambivalent, really. Uh, by the time, I mean, I was obviously very pleased that we were getting an audience and that people liked the show and people understood the show. I mean, that, that's the great thing, I think, about Prisoner um, fans is that they, they understand the sort of feminist, anti-prison message that's inherent in the show all the time. Um, on the other hand, I was very frustrated because by that time I'd been working for two years on the show. Nobody from Net from Grundy's even told me that it had been sold because they didn't want the cast to find out in case they asked for more money. And it, th at that time I was talking to uh, Grundy's and saying, look, I'm losing some very good people, writers like Michael Bridley, directors like Rod Hardy, they don't, they're fed up of working on the show. What I need is to produce another show here in Melbourne. I know you've sold a couple of pilots to the network. Can I have one of them and then we'll do the, I can then run two shows together and keep everybody fresh by moving the creative team across. And basically Grundy said, no, they didn't want to mess around with Prisoner, they just want me to stay there. So in a way, selling to America led to me resigning from the show because uh, I just didn't feel I could keep my energy levels up to produce it to the standard I wanted when I, you know, when I was only working on the one show, I, I'd just become tired. You, you get the research and you get lots and lots of stories that we could tell, but there was a, a lot of them were similar and you didn't, you started to feel like I've done this show before. I, I, I'm repeating myself. I need I need something new to refresh me. So I resigned, and I never watched the show when I after I'd resigned. I just didn't want to know what anybody else was doing with it because I I did feel sorry that I'd had to give it up, but I didn't feel that I had a choice. Staying on. Yeah. Um, this is a, a fan question from Connor Muller, uh, yeah. who, who's here in Australia. Uh, he'd like to know. Were there any cast members that you knew before Prisoner and did you have them in mind for certain roles? Right. The, the only, I only knew two actors. As I said, the show was produced in Melbourne and I only knew two actors from Sydney. I knew Peter Topano, who played Karen, because we'd worked together on The Young Doctors. And the only person in the whole show, in the cast, who was a mate of mine, was Maggie Kirkpatrick. And, of course, that's why I thought of her immediately when I decided to create the feet freak because we'd been mates back in Sydney you know years before uh, I'd made the I, I made prisoner can you run us through the process of making prisoner from the storyline ideas to the script development to the production the rehearsals and the shooting a shooting day on prisoner yeah. um, this this is for the fans okay well, uh, as I explained earlier, I, I sort of learned how to make television costing making shoes. There's a sort of uh, conveyor belt element to all this, because what you did on the Monday of the first week, I would sit with my writers and we would decide what the episodes for the week were going to be about. And then if it was the, uh, my sort of A-list writers, of which there are only a few, but Denise Morgan, Michael Brindley, and Lucas, obviously, Dave Worthington, they wrote their own storylines during that week. Otherwise, the storyliners wrote the scene breakdowns for the writers. On the Friday, I read the scene breakdowns and cleared them, and that was the first week we, we had storylines. They then went to the writers for three weeks to write the scripts. Um, what you've got to understand is all this is a layered one over another because as soon as that set of scripts went out to the writers, so we, we plotted another two hours and at the end of the week they went out to the writers. When they came back from the writers, we because we were working at such speed, we didn't actually give the writers a second chance. We, we got the scripts in and they went and I read them and the script editor read them 
and we decided what worked and what didn't and what needed to be changed. And then the script editor would do the rewrites themselves in house, which was another week. We then had the script ready for the director who had just come off post producing his previous week set block. And he spent the week preparing the scripts for the future. We then had a production meeting at the end of the week and they did location shooting for the two hours the following week. Whilst the location, once the location shots are finished, the week after that, we did the studio shoot. And I, I don't know if this is getting boring, but oh, no, it's basically, great. Love this. basically what happens is that because we're using the same, we use different crews, but because we're using the same cast, we would have to arrange it so that the, um, if, if, a, if an actor was doing a very heavy scene in the studio one week, they couldn't do the same thing the following, they couldn't do location shooting the same week. So we, we balanced them all over. And then once the show was finished, the editor actually did the offline edit to put the show together. And uh, then we put music onto it and delivered the show. So it took 13 weeks from the moment we thought of it to the moment that we uh, delivered it to the network. Reg Grundy approached you because he wanted to sell the show into more US cities, but he said he couldn't because of the swearing on Prisoner. <laughs> How did, he asked you if you could tell him to stop. How do you think prison would have been if there was no swearing? And what was it like saying no to Reg Grundy? <laughs> well, it wasn't hard because I, I knew I, it'd be a complete waste of time. It was a bit like um, telling the, the Tenma network that I'd agree to make the girls look prettier and made up. The actors would have sculpted me. You know, they, they, they owned their characters. They believed in the show. If I went in and said, look, girls, because we want to sell this show to more places in America for, my, for sales that you don't, aren't going to get any money from, you're not allowed to, to swear anymore. They just would have all gone on strike. You probably know they did go on strike on a number of occasions, but uh, it wasn't a hard decision because I just had no choice. I just had to stay true to the show. And what was the, what, what did he say when you said no? He didn't really say anything. He, 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 uh, we were at lunch, he finished his lunch. I remember I paid the bill. Uh, his chauffeur picked him up and he went back to Sydney and got back on the plane and went back to Los Angeles. And I didn't speak to him again for about 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, apart from the pantomime, did you ever put any, any other events of your life experiences into any prisoner episodes? By and large, no. I mean, basically, we were dealing with research. There was one story that I uh, got from first experience. There was a, a prisoner in Sydney called Jim McNeil, who was a uh, who, be, who became quite a cool celeb as a playwright. Um, he wrote a couple of plays while he was in prison called "The Old Familiar Juice" and "The Chocolate Frog," and the industry sort of fell in love with him and said. You're, uh, you know, you're a genius. You must be let out of prison, and they got him out of prison. Um, he actually married Robin Nevin, and within a few weeks, he drunk himself to death because he simply couldn't cope with that type of adulation uh, and whatever. And we did do a story similar to that for a woman who, as a painter, but apart from that, all the stories came from research, and you know. We search for more around the world. Wow. I know a lot of um, writers on like TV shows these days like to be on set just to make sure that the script's coming across how they've uh, how they've written it. Was that was that the same on Prisoner back in the day? Was no. It on set? No. <laughs> I, I have a, a fairly, I mean, I have a fairly strong feeling about this. If a writer wants to tell the director how they should be directing their scenes, they should become a director. They write the script, they discuss it with the director, the, with the producer, they, we discuss the thing, we discuss that we're all doing this, making the same show. And then you have to trust other people to do their job. Um, you can't do their job for them and you certainly can't step out in the middle of a, a take and say, no, 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 you're saying your line's wrong. Basically, we kept the, 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 uh, 
the writers away. There was an exception in Denise. She spent a lot of time around the, the uh, studio, but then she was a friend of the cast and in fact ended up in a long-term relationship with Fiona Spence, who played Vera. But that was a personal thing. In terms of letting a writer interfere with what the director was doing, for me, that was just a no-no. Uh, and even as the producer, I would be very reluctant to interfere with what the director is doing. Usually it only happened when we were running over time or uh, there were some other problems. Was there an episode that you produced and after it went to air, you wished it hadn't or, or something you would have changed about the episode? By and large, no. I think, I think the only time that we ran into trouble on like this was we got asked by the uh, Department of Immigration to do a story about women illegal immigrants being exploited and forced into prostitution and driven into the prison system. Uh, so it was a cautionary tale that basically said, if you're here and you're an illegal immigrant and something's happening bad to you, you're allowed, you can go to the authorities and nothing bad will happen. They'll protect you. That, that was what they wanted us to say. The problem then became, what sort of immigrant should we use? Uh, and back in the 70s, there were very few actors from Asia, so we decided to use a Greek girl. And that was a disaster because the Greek community really got up in arms about oh. the fact that we were suggesting a Greek girl uh, should be a prostitute. And it was really interesting with the, uh, the ratings in Melbourne, where you know there's a very big Greek community, dropped almost exactly by the percentage that the Greeks represented in the community for the whole run of that story. And the week the story ended, the ratings went back up again. And, and, and really, I, it, to some degree, it was my fault because the story shouldn't have been about a Greek girl. It should have been about an Asian girl. Um, but we just didn't have the pool of talent at that time. Different these days, you, there are Asian actresses around, but it, that, that was just a necessity. Wow. Um, Marcus Cole, so you gave him his first big break on Prisoner. Can you tell us about him and also One Way Ticket? in 1997, which you were the producer of the film, which was inspired by the real events of Peter Gibb and Heather Parker. Great movie. I, I'm, I'm interested that you couple the two because in fact, direct, in the end, Marcus didn't direct that. It is true that I took Marcus on as a trainee director and prisoner. You know, he'd actually gone through the film and television school. So he was, uh, he is a talent. I shouldn't, shouldn't put him in the past tense. He, he was very talented and he worked on Prisoner. Uh, all of the things that we, we, we did, a couple of shows subsequent to that. When I'd finished producing Prisoner, he came to me with a friend of his with a book called A Fortunate Life. I don't know if you know that, the A.B. Facey book. And basically he wanted me to produce it uh, and he, he wanted to be one of the directors. He wasn't experienced enough, possibly, um, but he, he, I agreed to do it and he did a fantastic job. He really was talented. We then, so that when the following year or so, when I made the great bookie robbery, um, I again hired him as one of the directors. Uh, and that wasn't as good a relationship because I think by now he was feeling more confident. And we spoke earlier about who has creative control in shows. He was very much of the, of the opinion that the director should have creative control. And I was very much of the opinion that the producer should have creative control. And given that there were two directors on the show and I wanted the show to be homogenous, not different, even though he did a fantastic job, we didn't work again for together again for about 14 years. When he again contacted me and said that his father, who was a journalist, was researching the, the story of one-way ticket and would I produce it and I we got Michael Brigley who was one of the original writers on Prisoner uh, and he sat in on the trial and we um, he wrote the script and we raised the money and then Marcus phoned from London from America saying he, he hadn't been well so he hadn't been working and he didn't want to leave America at that time because it would be bad for his career 
so we stayed in America and I got a guy called Richard Franklin to direct it. It's a pity. I think Marcus would have done a terrific job on it. And he and Michael Brindley were great friends, so that would have worked very well. But we never worked again together. I was, I was talking to Ken yesterday about One Way Ticket and um, Heather Parker, that she must have taken the, uh, the idea from the Mari Winter Escape with the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it, she, she was just the victim of a, an unhappy marriage who fell in love with a charismatic guy. You know, it's it's a great problem with men's, with women and men in prison because it's a totally artificial situation that they find themselves in. And it isn't unusual, of course, for prison staff to women to, to fall for, for, for prisoners. There's a certain type of woman who finds a bad man attractive and then ends up in trouble herself, which is, of course, one of the continuous themes of prisoner. Yeah. Max Dweeb. West Midlands and UK, was there any storyline that you wanted to write, but for whatever reason was not allowed to? No, no, that, that's, I think, as, as I've said several times, I, my terms of making Prisoner in the, was that I was in creative control of the show. And we had a, a message that we wanted to put out with the show, which was anti-prison, pro-women, particularly, you know, uh, and, and that, those are the stories we did. We, we weren't looking, you know, to do exposés or whatever. We, we were trying to get a theme put forward rather than doing exposés of, of particular stories. Following on with that one, was there a storyline or, or an episode that, that stood out to you more than, um, or better or greater than the rest of the show? There wasn't a storyline, no. As, as I said, Ken, the, we, we, the idea that all women were prisoners, all people were prisoners, and they had to find their own prison was a constant. And therefore, I didn't want stories to be standouts or whatever. I wanted them, I wanted that consistency of the message. There were episodes that were better shot, better directed more successful than others, but that was simply in the execution rather than in the storyline. I mean, episode three probably was a highlight in terms of direction and production. Janice Robinson asks, uh, have you ever watched Wentworth? And if so, what do you think of it? And were you surprised that Prisoner is just as popular today or so popular today, being watched by new generations as well as people who saw it the first time around? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a terrific question in, in, in lots of ways. But if I can answer it backwards, I'm, I'm not actually surprised that people still like Prisoner because it really was a sort of social document. We were talking about the condition of women. And unfortunately, 45 years later, women in society are just as badly off as they were when we made Prisoner at all uh, in the first place. So, so that people do still identify with the characters and, and, and the situations that we put them into. The question of Wentworth, I'm a little reluctant to answer, but I'll, I'll do it as discreetly as I can. I haven't watched Wentworth and I never, other than the first two episodes. And I watched the first episode to see what, they were, what they'd done to the idea. And I thought the idea that they had the same characters and swapped their names around and whatever really was kind of stupid, but that the production values of the show were really good. I also noted that they did a lot of the things that Channel 10 might have wanted in the first place because the characters were a lot sexier and they're a lot prettier. Frankie in Wentworth was, you know, good looking woman. I didn't see her in any boiler suits and fags hanging out of her mouth. So I, I didn't like what they'd done with it, but I thought what they, but I thought they produced it very well. Um, it was a well-produced show. I then watched the second episode to see the riot, and I don't think that worked. Uh, the problem they have is that the show hasn't been developed from original characters, and therefore they're making adjustments to things all the time as they 
as they work around existing characters. So I'm look, I can't tell you whether it's a good show or not because I've only seen two hours of it, but I, I didn't like the way it was developed. I have to do say about, about Wentworth, one thing it has done is given Prisoner a younger generation of fans. One thing I've oh, yeah. with, um, you know, there's certain episodes that are on YouTube and a lot of the comments are, wow, I've come here from watching Wentworth and found out that it was based on a show from the 70s. Yeah. Which is yeah. Uh, really fascinating. Yeah, look, look I, I, I have no objections to it. The, the point is, when I finish making a show, I never watch watch it subsequently. And basically this was doing exactly the same. You're looking at a different version of a show that I'd already made. And you can't expect me to be unbiased. You know, my word on, on, it, on whether Wentworth is a good show or not is worthless because I'm totally biased, <laughs> totally biased in, fa in favor of the original. So tell all the fans of Wentworth uh, not to worry that it, that I don't watch it. It's just simply a matter that uh, I wouldn't be watching it in the same way as them because I'd be watching it from the point of view of what have they done to my stories. Has there, has there ever been a show that you've wanted to create that you still think about today that never made it to uh, TV or a movie? Yeah, um, there, I, I was very disappointed. I went to England in 1996. I was commissioned to develop the first serial for Channel 5. Um, and I didn't get along with the head of drama. I wanted to make a show, one sort of show. She wanted to make a different show. Um, I won't go into details of it, but it, it was a very frustrating idea. I wanted to make a, an Australian style drama a serial with a hook. As you know, quite often there's a reason why you hang people, hook people on. She really wanted, she'd come off of um, uh, EastEnders and she wanted to make a remake of EastEnders. So I just had to walk away from that. Uh, that didn't work. But other than that, the only story that I really, I'm really upset that I couldn't tell is the story that I've actually written in my book, uh, The Parthian Shop. Which Again, have got here. Well, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I, I, I came across some research of a, an inquiry into a female private prison in, in Victoria where a woman had hung herself, which was very like the research we had from prisoner. But, but the prison itself was very different. It was run privately run. And the people who ran the prison didn't run it in order to keep the prison women in prison or to, to uh, rehabilitate them. They ran it to make a profit. So they cut corners in all sorts of ways. They only had two prison officers on, jail, on duty at night. Um, and they, and they, they happened to be in a sexual relationship. So they used to go off and lock themselves in a room screwing. And whilst this happened, the prison really was left to its own devices. There were stories of guys coming into the prison to meet their wives over the wall and then going out again. There were stories of women on days re day release who um, went and worked in the local brothel. So it seemed to me there was a fantastic miniseries in this. And I took it to Channel 10. But basically the same thing happened to me with Channel 10 as it happened back in the days of, of Prisoner in that the show I wanted to sell them wasn't the show they wanted to buy. They, what they wanted to buy was a prison show about where in the first episode, the same woman was in every scene. So you simply followed one woman. Now, uh, given that it was a story about the, the whole institution, I just thought that couldn't possibly work. So we stopped. I had, had Denise Morgan actually writing with me. It was the last thing she did before she died. But we just stopped the development. And then I subsequently decided I liked the story so much that when I was retired, I wrote a book about it. Amazing. Well, both, both Matt and I have read it. It is available, of course, from Amazon in paperback and a Kindle version as well. And uh, I found it absolutely fascinating. Thanks, Ken. I mean, it, it really was supposed to show how prisons have changed, um, given that they've become private and, and also how women prisoners have changed. 
the demographic of women prisoners these days is much more violent than it was back in the day when we made prisoner. And the women in, in uh, the Parthian shot are a lot more proactively criminal <laughs> than the women were in prisoner, I think. Ken was going to ask about the Network 10 supporting, never supporting prisoner. So I can answer that question quite quickly. They thought they were buying number 96 in prison, and they, a sex show. And what I delivered was different. Uh, uh, and therefore, we, we had this difference of opinion. It's interesting because there have been, I mean, Reg Watson did a remake of Prisoner in America called Dangerous Women. And so, and he actually did a lot of the things that Channel 10 wanted in Dangerous Women. The women were much more beautiful. They did have shorter skirts. They were sexier and it didn't work. So, you know, wow. the, the audience didn't believe them. So that basic, but, but with regards to the network, of course, once the audience figures started coming in, that was an entirely different matter. Nobody ever remembered about the fact that they didn't like the, the early episodes. Everybody was in favor of it. Yeah. What do they say about uh, success has many parents and failure as an orphan? Uh, you know, they, they were perfectly happy to let us uh, go ahead. Basically, you created one of the most iconic characters in Australian TV called The Freak, played you know, Joan Ferguson. Your idea for the for Joan Ferguson, Maggie Kirkpatrick, was your first choice to play. She was the only choice. I actually spoke to her agent. I mean, she was an old friend. I spoke to her agent, her agent before I even put the character into the show. I'm not quite sure what I would have done with the character had she said no, because Maggie's a specific person. I don't know who else I could have found who could have played that so well. Um, so, which is why <clears throat> I talked to her and cast it before I actually wrote it. And do you remember much of the public reaction at the time to her character on TV? You well, know? actually, interestingly, because of that 13 week delay from the time you create it to the time it goes to air, I'd actually finished working on Prisoner when, uh, when she first came to air. And in fact, I remember having a conversation with one of the Grundy executives who said to me, see, we don't need you on Prisoner. The ratings have <laughs> gone up since you've left. And I said, yes, of course they have, because you're now showing the shows that I made and you brought in Joan Ferguson. So I, I, I wasn't really aware of the reaction other than everybody was. I mean, she, it caused a stir in the same way that Frankie caused a stir, stir initially. Um, but they were the two sort of really standout characters. Who's, um, uh, whose idea was the, the, le the leather gloves, the black leather gloves? Where did that come from? Actually, during our research, Denise and I and a, few other, and a couple of other writers actually went into the female prison to see what it was like and to see things. And as we arrived, the woman who was there to greet us was wearing black leather gloves. <laughs> And Denise said, I was terrified about what she was going to do with those gloves. And it stuck in her mind. And she was the one who gave oh, wow. the black leather guns. It's, so it's just based on observation. Wow, that's amazing. Basically, it was just episode three. I was going to do a breakdown. Yeah, I'm looking at this. The only other question, which was interesting, is did you create other characters on Prisoner? But in fact, I mean, they were all named by Reg originally. All the guests that came in were created by me, but the only regular that I created was um, was Chrissy Latham, and I created her as a device to kill off Meg's husband, but also to cover an area that I felt wasn't in the original concept, and that is of female sexuality and desire and wanting. Uh, Amanda did that with a plum. She, <laughs> she managed to make the most weird thing sexy. <laughs> okay episode three which was directed by rod hardy written and produced by ian bradley and the cameramen were peter hine ken mulholland and noel penn first aired on the 28th of february 1979 so this was a really iconic episode because it was wentworth's first riot and um it's setting the scene for so many stories 
that continue on in uh, in the show. So the first scene was, um, you know, we've got B as a top dog, Vera as a nasty officer, Meg's life without Bill, Frankie not being top dog, Wentworth riot. Were you on the shooting of the first episode or? Uh, look, I did actually come out to the set a few times, but only because it was so complicated. It looked like we were running over time all the time, a bit like this interview, really. But, it, but in creative <laughs> terms, I, I wrote the script. Rod and I sat down extensively and discussed everything. He had the advantage that already Graham had directed one of the episodes, and so we, we knew the characters. Um, and basically, I had to trust him. Lots of things, little nuances that I wrote into the script appeared there, which was very pleasing. You know, I, I think, for example, the use of the uh, press in this episode were, was very pleasing to see. If you, if you look at it, actually, the first time you see Frankie, she's actually working the press. She's in charge. She's taken over the, the, the symbol. For the rest of the show, you never see the press because she doesn't have it and B doesn't have it. So all the other scenes were shot in different areas of the, ah. the, the laundry so that we, we would show that there was, this was a struggle still ongoing and nobody had won the prize. Nobody had won the power to bring down the press. Um, and that's why, you know, that's something you write as a writer and discuss with the director and keep your fingers crossed and hope that he gets it. I mean, I'm sure people watching it wouldn't understand it, but it was very satisfying for me as a writer. Also satisfying for me was the way in which the four pillars of the show, in other words, the, uh, the battle between Frankie and, uh, and B was mirrored by the conflict between Meg and v Vera. So you're setting up the whole thing in the show, not just setting the story. Oh, okay. That was, that was the power of the press. Yeah. The power of the press, yes. <laughs> Whoever was on the press was basically uh, the top dog. Well, yes. I mean, it was a weapon, wasn't it? You didn't mess with that. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the difference between getting a good director who picks up the nuances and, the, and an ordinary director who simply covers the story. So with the dining room scene and Vera's asked all the prisoners to leave, and it seems Frankie's calling all the shots and the top dog by the looks of it, everyone's waiting to see what Frankie's going to do because she's telling all the, all the inmates not to leave. Mrs. Davidson comes in, tells Frankie to get them back to work. We don't know, B's coming back, but did you intend to create a, like a top dog power struggle at that time? That it was like, Yes, I mean, the, the structure of episode three, you got to understand that nobody had written women like this before. <laughs> So I had to look for other sources. And really, it's like a Western. You have the top gunslinger, gunslinger and the former top gunslinger comes into town. And you have the sheriff who's ineffectual because they can't stop the inevitable. It was set up like a Western, you know. So th this is, that, that, that's essentially how I told the story. And of course, inevitably in the story, it's the innocents who get killed and Yes. injured the, not, not the main player so it, it was used to set up the whole dynamic of, of the show and that was another thing I wanted to ask about the another scene was um Meg and Bill Meg is telling Bill that uh Marty needs to talk to them both and Bill's saying he's too busy talk later walks off Vera walks up and goes you know what's what's wrong Meg she goes, oh, just some family troubles. And uh, she goes, oh, you've heard the rumours, haven't you, Meg, that he's, he's playing around with one of the girls. <laughs> I mean, it yeah. just starts to show a nasty side of Vera. I mean, not yeah, only well, well, that's Vera being Frankie. You know, that's Vera being the bad influence that's going to happen to be imposed on every character and every story in the future. Her yeah. influence is always going to make things worse. That's what I'm saying about the parallel between the two stories. Uh, between Meg and Vera and Frankie and V. There's, a, there's also an amusing scene with um, Marilyn and Lizzie, Lizzie breaking into the electricity box so that they'll have to call an electrician hoping that it would be a male. Uh, was it your idea to have Marilyn sleep with Eddie, in, uh, the electrician in the prisoner roof? 
I think you, you'll find it that uh, Marilyn and Eddie meet in episode one, um, and it came from the research. It, it was actually a plumber in the who was having an affair with a, an inmate. But there are fundamentals. There, there, there's a, a convention when you're going to do a story about a duel or a conflict like this. <clears throat> you have to have innocence caught in the crossfire. Eddie and Marilyn in the roof, the pregnant girl, the call on Meg and her husband to be somewhere else because her, their son has problems. These are all the classics that you use when you do a, a story about the gunfight at the Wentworth Detention Centre, which is you know, once a while. I really love that next scene that you wrote where B's coming back. So Vera's taking Frankie outside to the loading dock and the, the police van's pulling up and then the door opens and uh, out comes B and there's this iconic shot of Val Lehman standing yeah. in the, the prison van. Was that, was that your idea to have her come in back like oh, that? Absolutely. I mean, this, this is it. You, you, you have the two antagonists yeah. And you have the villain, the real villain of the piece, Vera, making sure they come face to face and, and anticipating and, and goading them into yeah. uh, the disaster that's to follow. So, as I say, it, it's, it's pretty classic Western confrontation stuff. I didn't invent anything. The big difference I did was I did it with women. Back in the dining room when Frankie arrives um, and she confronts B about, about her seat and then... Frankie is hoping that everyone will stay when Vera tells them all to leave, but B and a few of the girls leave and Frankie sits and uh, there's, she cries, a, a quite a powerful scene. And that's when Frankie smashes up the dining room. And it's interesting to see Lizzie helping Frankie, which you mentioned earlier on. Whose idea was it to have Lizzie on Frankie's side in the early episodes? Was that yours? You gotta understand, when I wrote Frankie in this episode, Denise hadn't joined us. So really, Denise hadn't developed the character. <clears throat> so the character changed to some degree. But she was this troublemaker and a stirrer anyway, so that was <laughs> perfectly acceptable. The main point about that particular scene, though it sounds kind of strange, really, was to show the vulnerability of Frankie. She seemed like she was tough, but really she's just a, yeah. a little girl who's lost in, in lots of ways and refusing to let the world see her, her, her weakness uh, and, you know, go as far as to kill or whatever rather than be a victim anymore because she's been a victim in her childhood and all the way through. So that was the real power of the scene as far as I'm concerned was showing her character. The, the next scene, which I want to talk to you about quickly and also ask Ken about this scene, was the, the basically the riot where Frankie had kidnapped Meg and uh, Bill Jackson's all, you know, frantic about it. And we've got this, this big scene with the, the, the music going. Eric is at the gate, which you didn't really see Erica at riots that much, but she was standing at the gate and Vera seemed to be controlling what was going on. They let Bill in to get Meg out. And then it's just on, like it's there's, there's yeah. stuff going on <laughs> everywhere. I mean, what was it like to shoot that, Ken? And uh, what was it like? Did you have the idea of writing Bill off so early? Yeah, in? yeah, yeah. It, that was we were to kill him before we cast him. Um, <laughs> the, it seemed to me that Meg was a fairly colorless character in the first episode. You know, she's just a nice lady. On the other hand, somebody who can treat other people like human beings, despite the fact that they, are be they have been responsible for a huge tragedy in their life, is somebody who is heroic. So really, I killed off Bill to make Meg a, a stronger character. And that's basically it. I mean, that was a yes. really uh, traumatic scene, seeing those scissors just <laughs> sticking out of his chest like that. Yes, I, I, look, I was particularly pleased with the with the finale and actually the way that uh, Elspeth delivered the are you satisfied and you got what you wanted I think was the was the line you know it, it really grabbed you I, I, I thought she was terrific in that scene and then be at the end all right who's next like it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. yeah well, well, well you see B isn't really doesn't really care about anybody else she's she just 
intent on re-establishing herself as top dog. Yeah. All the other stuff that's been going on, the jealousy of Chrissy F over Meg's husband and the, all, the, all the infighting and whatever, it's just irrelevant to her. She, she's just going to do what's necessary to become back in charge and have a comfortable life. That's why, uh, you know, we worked her story, even though they were juxtaposed, she wasn't really in, involved in all the subterfuge and the stabbing and all the rest of it. How, how would you compare Prisoner to all the other TV shows that you've, you've actually worked through? The real joy for me with Prisoner was that we got together an ensemble and we worked so closely together. We lived together. I don't mean that literally, but, you know, we socialised. We were a, a team. Um, the only other times that I've managed to get that sort of thing when I did the great bookie robbery was very much like that. And the reason for that is, uh, is that unfortunately, because I was a victim of my own success, because I became an executive very quickly, most of the other films that I made, uh, most of the other television I made, I was also doing something else at the same time. So, you know, we're shooting an indecent obsession in on Lord Howe Island, but I'm developing a fortunate life in Perth. So so your attentions are divided. Whereas with Prisoner, we were totally uh, immersed in the show. Everybody, in fact, lots of the women seem to almost take on the, <laughs> the persona of their characters. And I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, Jen. But, it, but that's, <laughs> that's how it was that, you know, it was like dealing with a load of female prisoners. And I say that with great affection. I think you you agree that that was pretty much the way. And, you know, when things went wrong, not necessarily when I was there, they tended to take on the same persona. Um, there, was, there was a, a time later on when the Grundy sold books about prisoner in America that were the sort of soft porn thing. And the women were indignant and went on, went on strike. And who's the speak? Who's the spokesperson? Who's in front? Who's in charge? B. It was they, they were it was just like living in Wentworth. It's a, it's a quick story I wanted to go over. Was you uh, you worked for Kerry Packer for some time? Yep, I've worked for a lot of big moguls. I mean, Reg Grundy was the other one. Dino De Laurentiis. I was with Hector Crawford. They're all basically, they were all basically the same in that, that they had a sort of tunnel vision about what they wanted. And they weren't really interested in anything else that, uh, that was going on. Kerry Packer was in some trouble with the, um, uh, with the inquiry about corruption at the bottom of the harbour scheme when, he, when I took over the television business. Uh, he, he just didn't want anybody asking any questions about anything. He'd pay for anything, he'd do anything, he'd get it all done. And, we, and it was almost incidental that we were so successful at PBL and made so many big shows. But once he was no longer under any threat from inquiries, he had no uh, loyalty to the production company at all. In fact, you know, I, I left and uh, the, uh, the production company ne never made another show. It's the same pretty much that they have this tunnel vision of, I know what it is I want and I'm going to get it. And the rest of you can <laughs> carry on. <laughs> and, you know, that obviously works. Do you actually still have any ideas in regard to television or, or have you really retired? I, as far as television is concerned, I've really retired. There, there are a whole set of stories left over that I, um, that I would have liked to have told. And basically, I spend my time there writing them as books. You know, I've done sci-fi books and autobiographies and comedy books. And I'm just about to put another book out called COVID, Cancer and Crocodiles, which, as a, you, you know, is fairly typical. That's what I spent my time doing in the, uh, in the lockdown is writing that book. It's a, it's a sort of Cain and Abel story set during the... Uh, COVID lockdowns. I, I, I'm quite happy to... The great thing about making television when I was making television is that they would leave you in charge. You, you could do it your way. 
that isn't the case in Australian television these days. But on the other hand, if I write books, the book comes out the way I intended it to. So it's it's my way of getting back in charge. And, I, and without that control, I really don't want to do anything. Uh, 1991, you took over Grundy's Australia, Australia. Can you tell the fans what that job entailed and what it was like working for Grundy's? And then in 1992, you're appointed vice president of drama for Grundy Worldwide, which made you responsible for the 200 hours of drama production a year, which seems a lot. Yeah, there was something very strange that, <clears throat> that happened with Grundy's because at the same time that they started to become less important in the television scene in Australia, they became more and more important in the television scene elsewhere. Um, so that we were producing series in Holland, in Germany, in Italy, in New Zealand. My job really <coughs> was to make sure to, to supply all those shows with the creative talent because we would send storyliners and producers, directors to all those countries because what we could do that others couldn't was produce quality television on a lower budget. So that became, to a large extent, an organisational job rather than a, a creative job. And for that reason, I, I didn't stick with it too long. Um, when Grundy's were sold to Pe Pearson's in the, in the UK, and it was clear that Pearson's weren't interested in developing new dramas other than serials, then I just basically left. Last of the fan questions is, Ian, sorry, Mark Stubbs from Cheshire in UK. Ian, do you have any keepsakes, souvenirs, memorabilia from your time on the show, like scripts, props, fan cards, photos? No. <laughs> one of, one of the, uh, the great things you have to do, particularly if you've made so many shows, is you have to wrap yourself entirely in the show you're making and it's all consuming. And when it's over, what you really want to do is just forget about it and move and do exactly the same thing with the next show. So, I mean, I've got a, a few, I don't know if you can see them yet, they're up on the shelf there. I've got a few AFI awards and Logie awards and Henry Lawson awards still stuck up there, but I don't keep scripts. I do have a library of all my fav the favorite episodes that I've made, a lot of films I've made, but to show you how uh, how important they are, I, most of them are still on on VHS. I have to, I'd have to take the dust off the top of them. But apart from keeping copies of the shows, I don't I don't keep anything. This is from David C. Collins in the UK. You and your wife Anne Lucas wrote some brilliant episodes during the first four seasons of the show. What was it like working with fellow writers like Denise Morgan, Sheila Sibley, and Michael Brindley? And do you wish that you had stayed on the show as producer a bit longer? I'm not quite sure why she's chosen those three names, but, um, but, but they actually worked in very different ways. Denise and Michael were the two writers that I took down to Melbourne with me and we developed The Prisoner together. So they, they were very special and they were very instrumental in setting the show. Sheila was just a, a freelance writer and I... I don't have any great memories of her on the show at all. David does also say that the cast always spoke very fondly of the crew and you were one of their favourite producers. Do you have any personal favourite recollections? Look, I, I think the, the, the thing about Prisoner, as I said, is that we built a camaraderie amongst the cast and the, the production team that, you know, really has lasted for years and years and years. I mean, I only ever see you at prisoner reunions, but, you know, that that whole thing has, has lasted. And so there are no real standouts in there. I could tell you lots of funny stories about, uh, I mean, the day Colette Mann stole the television station manager's furniture or uh, or whatever. Yes. But, <laughs> but, you know, mostly... What I remember is that we got along extremely well and we were all doing the same thing. And in lots of ways, we were sort of a group 
against Grundy's, against Channel 10 management, we were just, we were going to make the show and we were going to protect it. And, and that's, that's how we lived. Wow. Rebels. Rebels, yeah. yeah. Scott Davies asked, was there any big characters that you asked to bring, like come back, but they declined? So that it left? Yeah, certainly not in my time. Okay, uh, the last fan question comes from Martin James B. Was there a continuity editor, any diva on set, or who was the most fun actress to work with? <laughs> Look, uh, I, I, I think I've all, almost already explained that we were a very close, tight-knit group, but, you know, I was also terrified of them. You know, there were, there were dozens of them, <laughs> only me. Um, and uh, and then when we even got into the script department with Denise and Annie, my wife, and whatever, I would never dream of picking favourites amongst them. I don't remember ever having a bad time with any actress on Prisoner, and, th and that's very unusual. Just about every show that I've m made otherwise, at some stage or other, there's a there's a friction. But the women on Prisoner basically we're a group that stuck together and uh, and, I, and i just would like to differentiate between them that's great here's some poses for you <laughs> for diplomacy <laughs> well you 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 might have had different experiences with some of the women no, but not at all i, I, I know that family. i know that after i left there was quite a lot of trouble between the cast and the uh, and the management but that was always because the cast were protective of the show, nothing to do with anything else. There's a lot of conspiracy theories, I would say. There's a lot of unanswered questions about this character. And even as of this morning, just on our YouTube channel, there was someone that saying, can you ask about this character? Because we all want to know. <laughs> You've got me intrigued now. <laughs> Well, it was because you wrote a couple of the episodes that she was in and you you wrote the last episode she was in, which was Sandy Edwards, played by Louise Linnae, who her final scene is by the, the big bin, the dump master, talking with Kate Peterson, the doctor. And then um, Mari Winter and Sandy Edwards were conspiring to kill Kate Peterson. And then that was the setup. And then Kate Peterson walked back in and Mari Winter's just absolutely shocked because she thought it was sandy that was going to walk back in and then sandy's never heard of again and the final scene is the truck leaving the gates in wentworth and there's just so many fans that ask about sandy edwards what actually happened to her okay Can we break uh, some i'm talking about <clears throat> I, I, I don't know whether this is going to uh, spoil the illusions of reality um the actress involved i think from memory was pregnant but I but certainly she suddenly became unavailable to us so halfway through that story we sort of changed it and said okay well we'll get her out of the place I don't know whether she'll ever be available again um, and I don't so I don't know whether we're ever going to bring her back again so we won't make it clear that she escaped we'll leave the feeling that she might have been killed so that if she was killed, she'd never come back. Um, and if she uh, ever becomes available again, and, and we think up a story, we might be able to bring her back. But it, it was purely a device governed by the actor, as I remember. But I am talking about 40 years ago. So if my memory is faulty, I'll, uh, I'll leave it with you. That was gonna be one more question was, had she stayed, would that scene she would have killed Kate Peterson? Would that be a, a direction they would have gone? Yes. <laughs> Probably. Possibly. Yeah. It didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just had to change the story because of uh, availability. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Ian. It's been an absolute okay. pleasure and honour to actually learn about your life and your time on Prisoner. I really appreciate it. Well, I hope I haven't gone on too long, but uh, I've done my best to ask to answer them, but it's it's kind of difficult, you know. We're talking about forty years ago, yeah. and I and I think if I hadn't uh, reread my memoirs and uh, had a look at a couple of episodes, I'm not sure I could have done this. We thank but, you very much, Ian, for your time and your memory. Mm -hmm.